CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Clapp, Arlington's Conservation Administrator. The March 21st, 2024 meeting of the, of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, which extended remote participation in public meetings until 3-21-2025. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. All meeting materials can be found at the link I'm putting in the chat right now. Chuck Taroni is our Conservation Commission Chair and will facilitate tonight's meeting. Please note that there will be a public comment period for each hearing, and each vote taken during this meeting will be conducted via a roll call vote, and we will begin with a roll call vote of attendance. Chuck, are you there? I have so many people on my screen, I can't see. Sure, I'm, I'm okay. right here. Okay, great. So I'm really happy we started on time tonight because traffic. So, um, Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Um, Brian McBride. Yes. Associate member oh, Chuck Taroni is here. And associate member uh, Sarah Alfaro Franco. Present. And Eileen Coleman. I'm here. Great. So everyone but And Chuck, uh, you forgot me. Susan Chapnick. Oh, and Susan Present. Chapnick. Sorry, Susan. That's okay. Not a problem. Okay. And I'll go over the agenda real quickly. Uh, so tonight's uh, for tonight's meeting, we're going to review the minutes and then correspondence. And then we'll talk about a uh, request from the Friends of Spy Pond Park for some reimbursements, a request for a certificate of compliance, 19 Sheridan Park. Um, Water Bodies Working Group will give an update, an update from the Tree Committee and the Artificial Turf Committee. Our hearings tonight will be uh, request for determination 36 Peabody, notice of intent for two reservoir, request for determination of applicability for, um, this is a continuation for 459 Mystic Street, and then we'll um, go to Thorndike Place, and that anyone here that's come for the amended order of conditions for idiot Coolidge will continue this later on in the meeting, but I just want to let you know that it will be continued to April 4th when we get to that point in the meeting. Okay, and with that, we could start reviewing the minutes. Are those available, Ryan? Uh, no, I didn't have those uploaded in time, so we will have a couple sets for next time. Sure, Thanks. and I'll just- if we could defer that because I didn't have a chance to review them, I didn't see them either. Thanks. Sounds great. Perfect. Okay, so next on the list is uh, correspondence and uh, all the correspondence, which does not include correspondence that we received from uh, Thorndike Place. I'll actually mention that in, in uh, within the meeting for Thorndike Place, but so all correspondence available um, is available to the public for a full list. You need to contact the conservation agent at um, our website, and Ryan will provide that in the chat right now. So with that, we want to go to our first item on the agenda, and that's a request. Uh, so it's a request for uh, from Friends of Spy Pond Park uh, for reimbursement from the Conservation Commission Land Stewardship Fund. Uh, the Conservation Commission votes on reimbursement and the Land Stewardship Fund pays for the funds for plants, compost, and mulch. Uh, the vote, as I see it from the, from the um, email that I received, and people correct me if I got this wrong, the total is $591 and it would be separated into two votes. The first vote is to approve the reimbursement for the, uh, the reimbursement of $450.59 for Adrian Landry. And then the second vote would be for the Friends of um, Spy Pond Park for $140.41. Is anyone here to speak to that tonight or should we just continue with the vote? 
Okay. I see. Do I see a hand? Any hands there, uh, Ryan? No, I don't see either. Okay. So let's go with the first vote. Uh, do I have a motion to vote a total of uh, a total of four hundred fifty dollars and fifty nine cents? Um, so moved. I'll second it. Uh, and that would be for Andrea uh, Adrian Landry, and then the second vote would be a reimbursement for Spy Pond, uh, the Friends of Spy Pond Park, and that's for one hundred and forty dollars and forty one cents. We we'll vote for that. I'll, I'll move. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I, I, I think there were first, Chuck. Hold on, sorry. You you have to vote first, don't you? Have to vote yeah. before you make. Yeah, I think yeah. I. Uh, yeah. Okay. I jumped a little bit here. So let's okay. go back to the first vote. So I got a I got a um motion from Nathaniel. As Nathaniel's I moving to, yeah. And who seconded? And I believe this is for the yeah. Okay. Could you yeah. tell me which one this is? This is the four fifty fifty nine for what? It's for, for spot point part. No, I no, know. It's a, so as I read it is for Adrian Landry. And and what did she purchase? Uh, they she purchased plants, compost, and mulch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, okay, right. So she says oh, it's a little confusing because she's on Friends of Spy Pond Park. She's talking about Spy Friends of Spy Pond Park, right? So she purchased four fifty fifty nine, as Chuck said. She wants to be reimbursed for that, and then Friends wants to be reimbursed for one forty forty one. That's right. right. So I moved for Adrian Landry for four fifty fifty nine. I'll second that one. Yeah, second. Okay, let's go through the vote. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Mm, Brian McBride. Yes. Uh, David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, moving on to the next vote, and this is for the Friends of Spy Pond Park for the total amount of one hundred and forty dollars and forty-one cents. Can I get a motion on that? And this is for what materials? So the materials wasn't separated, but there was a comment about um, they were reimbursed. Um, mm. So it, it had to do, it's the same amount. It was for shrubs, but they had uh, quicker access to where they were because the plant supplies were not available. So they jumped in and uh, spent the money and would like to get reimbursed. I'll move. So the, the second? I'll second that. And this is, yeah, 140 bucks. Yep. 140, $40. And let's go down the rest. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And David White. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, that's taken care of. So Chuck, um, just as a point of process, Ryan and or David need to forward the this vote. Mm -hmm and the land material trust. to the Arlington Land Trust so that they can release the funds for this. Well, they, they might have to vote on it too, I don't know, but we're supposed to vote and then tell them we did. And it's, it's, it's the treasurer, yeah. yeah. John All Payton. right, Ryan, uh, I, I guess you heard that. So um, John that's, the, that's the process, yeah. Okay, Thank so you. If, we're, if we're done with that, the next thing on the agenda, under discussions is a request for a certificate of compliance for 19 Sheridan Park. Uh, Ryan, I think you uh, conducted a site visit on March 15th. Uh, can you update the commission on your site visit? Uh, yes. So I did a site visit uh, last Friday, so that was March 15th. Um, I was informed that the project was for the uh, installation of two dry wells uh, in the rear of uh, 19 Sheraton Park, um, which I observed and I did take several photos, which were uploaded uh, with the meeting materials. Uh, however, when I got back to the office, I noted that the plan that was attached, uh, the original plan uh, included a planting plan. And then there was some uh, discussion about a, an addition 
Uh, David Morgan informed me that those items were pulled back and were uh, withdrawn from the application uh, and that there might have been a uh, request for determination of applicability that was filed after the fact. Uh, I didn't see any documentation for that. Uh, we do have the homeowner here as well who might be able to provide some insight as well. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, who's here for uh, Sheridan Impact? 19 Sheridan yeah. Impact? Yeah, hi, I'm hi. here. My name is Nurgis Mavavala. Hi, uh, and, uh, hi, good to see you all again. Uh, so yes, I think Ryan has has it mostly correct. We we came in front of the the commission uh, last year with a uh, with an, a planting plan. In addition to doing the the dry wells, we wanted to get the dry wells done first before we did anything else. At the time, you were you were concerned about a patio we had in the. Uh, uh, in, in the drawings that Melissa McDonald had drawn up for us. So we withdrew everything but completing the dry wells, which we needed to do just to complete the construction project. So those have been done now, and that, that this was for just that, installing two dry wells. Uh, and, and we've provided the as built for, uh, you know, uh, to complete the, the project. Okay, thank you for that uh, information. Is uh, I think I'm going to at this point open it up to the Conservation Commission, uh, and I see that Susan Chapnick's hands up. Susan, thank thanks, Chuck. Um, I guess my question is: um, Were there two um, two two uh, permits or hearings? Was there one for a the dry wells and one for the the planting, et cetera? Or was there just one? So what happened was last time we had come, we had come with a, a comprehensive plan that included installing the dry wells, a patio and some plantings. And at your recommendation, at the recommendation of the commission, uh, uh, there, there were concerns about the patio. So we withdrew the patio and the plantings at that. That's what you asked us to do. And we continued only with the uh, with the dry wells, which is what we've done. And at the time, I think we worked with, with Dave Morgan and uh, we were told that all we needed to do was the uh, uh, the dry wells and, and the certificate of compliance, uh, sorry, the as built to get our certificate of compliance. So that's what we are here for today. Okay, so why, I guess my misunderstanding then is it looks like there's a, an order of conditions from 2011, correct. but you're saying you were here last year, which is 2023. Yes, correct. You're right. So let me, let me step back a little. So in 2011, we, we, we built, uh, uh, you know, we did a big renovation and built some parts of the house. And as part of, of, of that, we had an, uh, an order of conditions, which was never closed out. And uh, a part of that was, so we came back last year to say we want to close that out, but here's all the additional things we want to do. Uh, and that's when you advised us not to, to separate out those two things, to complete the order of conditions, which was the dry wells and the, and the uh, as built, and then to deal with the plantings and the other things we want to do at a later date, which we have done. Okay. okay. So I think there's some confusion because the Conservation Commission process would not have allowed you to not complete things on the order of conditions specifically without some kind of a change or addendum so so i don't know if that we need to review this with david morgan again in our files but i am uncomfortable because the original order of conditions does have plantings required which were not done and it sounds like then there was another process for these dry wells, which may have been an RDA, a separate RDA. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm confused. I, maybe Nathaniel has something am, to say. I am yeah. too. There was no plantings in, in the original. This was just part of our, our construction project. Hmm. Nathaniel. I, I just want to echo Susan's um, sentiments that I think we need to do some more research on this. I'm not comfortable with uh, signing up on this. I think there's a number of questions that have been raised already. I also have a question about Ryan's note saying the deck in the rear of the house has been expanded upon, and it's just not clear if he's saying that that's within the buffer zone uh, and that's uh, not permitted. Uh, yeah, so it's larger than what is on the, uh, the plan that was Roof that we had that uh was uploaded with the agenda materials. Uh, let me see here. So that was so that could have been permitted maybe under the prior 
Um, right. Although, although this actually, sorry, this DEP final number 230 is the from 2011. So yeah, I think we have a, a bit more work to do on this before so, you know, sorting out what, what's what before I'm comfortable voting on it. Otherwise, yeah. I'd vote for non-compliance. So, so David Morgan's email, and unfortunately he's out sick today, did say that there was an RDA for the dry wells, and that's all that we were looking at. But an RDA does not require a certificate of compliance. And then we still don't right. have a certificate of compliance then for the original permit, right, from 2011. I, I think that's right. yeah I yeah that, uh, yeah mm -hmm. okay so, yeah I, I I would say we should continue this and work straighten this out. So it seems <laughs> like we're at a disadvantage that uh, our <laughs> conservation agents not here tonight. Um, and David Morgan, uh, it didn't plan to be away, but that, like Susan Chapnick said, he got sick and he won't be attending tonight's meeting. Uh, do, would you like to add anything else, Nurgis? I would like to add something. So, uh, could you uh, uh, just when, uh, state your name and address yes, for the Aida record? Yes, uh, Aida Khan. So, when we built the house, what we had left to get the order of conditions completed was the dry wells and the as built. And David advised us, I don't remember all your acronyms, et cetera, but David advised us to do something simpler than that original plan with Melissa McDonald's landscaping plan. And so he said, so we, when we went in front of you a year and a half ago or a year ago, um, the under, the, what was agreed was that we would put in the dry wells and do the as built and then complete the project. And so we resubmitted the order of conditions filing fee since it had lapsed. Um, and David said, that was what we needed to do. And uh, we needed to just do the dry wells and the uh, as built to get the certificate of compliance to close out that original construction back in 2013, was it? 2011, something like that. Hmm. And so that was what the commissions told us to do when we went in front of you a year ago. So I'm just confused about why there's more involved here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that we have the full story. We're confused too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why we'd like to sort it out uh, mm -hmm. because David Morgan's not here. Ryan's memo raises a concern about that there's an expanded deck, but maybe that's referring to a plan he did not have the benefit of having. No, there's no expanded deck. The deck is from the original drawings yeah. that you had back when we applied to do this whole project. Yeah, I'm right. looking at the plans right now, and I'm realizing that I put that in mistake. I was looking at the the wrong deck. Uh, I was looking at. I got, I got mixed up when I was looking at it. There's there's no issue with that deck that I'm seeing. So I will re I'll, I'll revise that memo. Yeah. We've kind of followed pretty much exactly what you've asked us to do. So uh, this this comes as a real surprise. We understand. We're mm -hmm. just we again. We have the disadvantage as to, as Chuck explained that David Morgan's not here to straighten us out. We uh, Ryan made a mistake on the memo, so I think all we're asking is if you can come back to the next meeting, and we we'll, we should be able to straighten us out. We're not we're not denying anything can, or withholding can, anything. Can David just, just clear it up with you, and then you just we have two young kids. It's it's very hard for us to come to the evening to meetings. This. So. Is there a well, way? I'm sorry, David's not here. Is we're saying so. No, no, I understand. I'm just asking. When I have had conversation with David in the last like week or so, and he said this is a very simple matter. You've done what's you know was asked, and he thought this was going to take like ten minutes. So well, can you like, talk yeah. to him and then just it's, do we have we're to, really to make it? Yes, yeah, so we, we will. We will speak with him, and yeah, we'll speak with him and uh, discuss this further at the next meeting. That's what you're not required to attend, if, uh, but you're certainly welcome to attend. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I think, okay. I think it would David be helpful. Can, yeah, David can reach out in the meantime if he has any questions. Okay, sounds good. Because it sounds I, like I, you're, you're here I, yeah. to get a sign off for something that you might not even need to sign off on. So <laughs> that's why. 
It sounds like what I missed that. No, no, I, I think they, I think they have an open order of conditions. Uh, did. Yeah, okay. I, I think that that needs to be closed out. Oh, so, so let me just recap, and I apologize that we're not paired. Um, certain uh, staff takes care of certain projects, and there just wasn't enough time for Ryan to get up to date on on this project when David had so much of the past information. Um, so. I think what I would suggest is to uh, have David, uh, you know, talk to me and the vice chair. And since Susan had a lot of the questions, and then if another site visit is needed, you know, I could attend with David and and possibly Susan and the rest of the commission. But um, given that, we wouldn't be able to proceed tonight. So we'd like to just continue this matter to April 4th and, uh, it's possible that you don't need to attend, but there's always something that, you know, could come up that you could solve quickly if you if you were available for the meeting. We'll put you as close to the beginning at seven o'clock as we possibly can, if that helps. Okay, and, uh, sounds good. Okay, all right. Uh, Doc, so do you with see that Mike Gildas game has his hand? Oh, up? I didn't see that. Okay. Sorry, Mike. Mike. Yeah, just a quick question on the planting plan. I don't know if that's part of the order of conditions or if that's no, it is not. That's not. No, we withdrew that whole thing, and that's dead. So, so that's the that's the problem. We don't have that paperwork because it's still in there. That's it's why. Still well, that's, in. that's from David's yeah. side, I believe. Because, okay, so and, we'll get this straightened yeah. out. Yeah, we'll get okay. it straightened out. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And with that, could I get a motion? I uh, make a motion. To to oh, sorry, Nathaniel. No, I'll second Susan's motion to continue okay. to the next meeting. <laughs> Great. So we have a motion and a second for continuing this uh, discussion to the next meeting, which is April 4th. Uh, Mike Gildas game. Yes. Uh, Susan Chapnick. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, let me just, uh, Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David White. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. So I think I got everyone. And uh, just to make a note, I'd like to, I know that David Kaplan is going to come into the meeting as soon as he's finished up in, at his own meeting. And uh, if someone could just announce that, I would like that um, to be very clear for these proceedings. So moving forward, we have uh, Water Bodies Working Group and um, David White, uh, he's going to unmute and give us an update. David, please take over. Okay, um, four items. The spy, con, the spy Pond contract has been completed, and they're starting work on that project. The um, res water chassis control will take place on the weeks of June 10th and June 17th, for two weeks. Presented the uh, budget at the FinCom meeting on Monday. It seemed to go well, but I have no word yet on their decision. We increased the budget quite a bit from last year. 120,000 this year compared to like 70, 50,000 last year. So it's a big increase. So we'll see what happens. And also the Water Bodies Working Group has agreed that the flooding wetlands in Hills Pond are not needed anymore because they're, they're not viable under the current circumstances. And uh, you made a recommendation to remove those? Yes. Okay. How many are there? Two. I, yeah, think, I think there were three, and one of them they're keeping because they want to move it over in a different section of the pond for another function, and I forgot what that was, David, that they mentioned. Me too, yeah. They mentioned it in a meeting. But um, the problem is that when, when the pond is treated with diquat, um, all the vegetation goes away that was planted on there. Mm. So so it's really, we didn't think about that because we didn't think about chemical treatments when we put that in there. So it wasn't quite a, it's not viable. What they're going to try to do is pull them close to shore and have them removed by water and wetland when water and wetland, who is their vendor, comes and does their aquatic management and see if we can repurpose them somewhere else if we so choose. So 
that's something for the water bodies working group to think about. I think they're keeping one for the for the ducks and turtles, maybe. Oh, that's right. Okay. For the turtles. I was gonna say the, the turtles, turtles like to them. sun on mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um anything else, David? That's basically the news. Okay. Uh don't see any hands raised by the commission. We can move on to our next uh, update, which would be from the tree committee. Um, and it's Sarah Alfaro Franco. And uh, do you have an update for us, Sarah? Uh, yes. Uh, during the last meeting, um, the, the committee revisited roles and responsibilities. Um, they voted in a new chair and co-chair. They also welcomed two new members to the committee. Um, they mentioned that uh, spring planting is scheduled a month and a half early because of the weather. Um, and the plan is for 150 trees to be planted. Uh, mm -hmm. They also mentioned an effort to continue the community canopy program. Last year, uh, they, it, was, uh, it involved 64 trees. And this year they're gonna be try to target uh, you know, uh, residents uh, along the areas of um, you know, heat islands to try to um, see if they can, you know, um, see if they can uh, help that, that situation. Uh, the next meeting is scheduled for April 10th. Oh, thank you, Sarah. That was, uh, that's nice, 150 trees, big project. Okay, moving on. We have Chuck, David has a question. David, oh, what? sorry. That's David, okay. I'm just going to help you because there's a lot of people on. You probably don't see all the hands. No, I, I just didn't look up. Um, yeah. Go okay. ahead. You said a month and a half earlier? Uh, yes. Yes, because of the same in the future? Is that going to be an ongoing schedule? I, I don't know. It was not mentioned. Just it seems like a big change. Big change. Big change, yeah. Okay, not hearing anything from Susan. I'm gonna move on to the artificial turf study committee update from Mike Gill's game. Uh, and I was just wondering because it was mentioned that uh, we don't have the time and day for the next meeting. So if you know that, can you make that part of your report? Yes, I'd be glad to. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, the artificial turf study committee uh, is winding down. We have three more meetings. In the uh, succeeding Tuesdays, uh, uh, starting next Tuesday, uh, and the following two Tuesdays, starting at five o'clock online as usual. And I'm glad to report that I think the committee uh, has uh, nicely come together and uh, has, uh, I know that the chair and the clerk for the committee are working to integrate uh, the reports and information that was provided uh, by each of the subgroups uh, on uh, public health, safety, and environmental issues. And so we're looking forward to receiving that and hope to wrap up, uh, you know, in three weeks. So then uh, the town will deal with the results of the committee and uh, decide what to do from there. Okay. Uh, I see a couple of hands up. And first I saw Brian McBride. Uh, just, once Mike is done, I just wanted to give a quick sentence on the CPA update. That's all. Okay. Let's go to Susan Chapnick then. Hi. I just want to say, Mike, I think that the committee um, decided not to meet next Tuesday and make it either Wednesday or Thursday, but it hasn't been set oh, yet because there was a conflict. So right. I just want to tell everybody the best if you want to to join the Zoom meeting, just go on the website. The Artificial Turf Study Committee has their I own page that. under under Arlington, and you can see. And they put the minutes up, and the minutes are very well done. The other, um, if anybody's interested in in understanding what the committee, you know, where the committee is going, um, you can look at their draft reports. There are some draft reports up from the subcommittees, which are going to probably be um there'll be they'll there's going to be a, a an overall comprehensive report for for next week's meeting but there are draft reports from each subcommittee up there now um for the public yeah just to follow up susan thank you the um the final turf committee is going to be on the 9th of april 
And uh, the second uh, April 2nd meeting uh, is going to be uh, also held. And I don't have the, I know the next one is, as you said, not um, Tuesday as usual, but uh, that, that, that should be on the website. Okay, um, seeing no hands, uh, we're gonna get a CPA update, Com Community Preservation Act update from Brian McBride. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Uh, so just quickly, uh, the, the CPA did pass their proposed budget several weeks ago, I guess now, and uh, they were able to fund almost all of the requests uh, for funding. They did postpone the tennis court uh, project done, I think it's the Gibbs School area down in East Arlington. Uh, but did fund a study of that uh, project. And if it's successful, they would come in and fund the rest of it next year. But by and large, all the uh, requests were met. Um, so that was now circulating, I believe, to the Finance Committee and the Select Board and so forth. And there'll be a vote on that at town meeting. Uh, there'll, be some, there'll be the next big step for the CPA. Uh, so when the town meeting passes that, then the, the funding process will continue. And then the only other update is from last year, uh, there's uh, still uh, leftover work on Hills Hill that was funded last year, but with some conditions, the uh, working group has completed its group on, on the Hills Hill mountain bike project. There'll be a the public input meeting next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Where, where that uh, proposal will be presented to the public for public input. And if that passes uh, public muster, it will go to the um, PRC committee and then on to, um, the CPA if necessary for final approval. So that's that's the latest on CPA. All right, Brian. I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna move on to um, the next thing. So number three on our agenda is the hearings. And the first hearing tonight is a request for determination of applicability for 36 Peabody Road. And Susan Chapnick, the vice chair of the Conservation Commission will lead the commission through this application. Susan. Thank you, Chuck. Um, this is a request for determination of applicability at 36 Peabody Road um, to consider uh, an addition to the existing structure um, at this address, along with landscaping and hardscaping activities within the 100-foot buffer zone and adjacent upland resource area to Spy Pond. Um, on the left, just briefly on the left-hand side is the uh, what what is at the property right now. Um, and the right-hand side is the proposal uh, for our consideration. And I wonder if there is the applicant here to present um, yes. the project. Okay, yes, we're Eliza, here. thank you yep. very much. And this is my husband, Ian, we're here together. Okay, uh, so Eliza Hatch and Ian? Ian Jessen. Jessen, okay, and at the, for, of 36 Peabody Road, thank you. Um, so we had uh, an NOI back with you guys in 2017, 18. 18. 2018, it just closed. Uh, so all of the work you see on the left was done under that. None of those walls were there. Um, and so at this point, we are hoping to put a small addition on our house to add a guest room um, and uh, a primary bathroom. Um, and in order to do that, uh, the distance between the staircase we have and the proposed addition is quite small. So we wanted to give ourselves a little more space. Um, in addition, when we did the uh, initial construction of the walls and the stairs, we did everything. We had everything done with no machinery um, per our conditions, which on such a steep hill was quite a feat. And we tried very hard to keep everything freestanding. Um, unfortunately, the staircase on the side that we're trying to adjust, um, the materials that we used for the freestanding wall just aren't quite up to the task of holding up the hill, which is incredibly steep in that area. So we're still getting a lot of erosion in that area. Um, the plants we've put in, that's the only area we've had trouble with plants. Everywhere else, we keep adding and adding and adding plants. Um, so the hope is that we're able to shift the staircase a little bit to give us some more space, change the materials to make sure it's structurally sound so it, it isn't pushed over by erosion um, as the current stairs have been, and also add a small section of retaining wall just to give us another planting area and stabilize the hillside a little bit um, in hopes that uh, it can, you know, retain plants and stop running dirt all the way down to the pond. Um, 
Did you have anything to add? Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is uh, when we when we talk about the the materials that were used um, throughout um, when all these new retaining walls went in a few years ago, um, I don't actually know what the materials are called, but they're they're effectively like Lego bricks, right? They they go down on top of each other, and then there's a geo grid uh, that gets um, sandwiched between the layers and extends back into the into the hill to stabilize it. Everywhere uh, that that was done has. Uh, been really very stable and, and is doing its job. The one wall uh, that edges these stairs, because it edges the stairs, there's no room for that geo grid uh, to get into any soil behind them. And that's the area that the wall is is starting to, to lean over. So um, it, it was just the wrong material to use in that particular portion of this wall. Um, so what we're planning to doing in, in that little strip, which is uh, uh, the outside of the the curved wall um, is to do that area in like a mortared field stone, something that that will be stable. Um, and then the the rest of the material uh, is as it was when it was installed with the NOI. Which and if you see the the top of the screen with the staircase that says down at the very top of the picture, that was also done with mortar in the initial NOI because of the same problem, and we just didn't. We we should have done it. We should have done it in both places, and we didn't. So I think that's. If, uh, are there any questions that we can answer? We're obviously not um, super. Yes. Yeah, so, I have I'm a few sorry. questions and then I, I'm sure there there might be um, commissioners that have questions. And and I'm sorry again that that our agent that had dealt with you, Dave, David Morgan, is out sick tonight. So I'm right. at a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, so you got an order of conditions for the prior work. Yes. Um, and did you get a certificate of compliance for that? Do you know? And yep. when was that? Um, oh. November, very of recent. past year, I believe so. Okay. So it was either November of 23 or November of 22. It was probably, I'll look it up. I believe it was November of 22. I don't think it was. Okay. Well, that's something we should have, but, um, yes. you know, that's something that, that the commission would want to see because they'd want to know, okay, that work was done and the certificate was done and we should have that in our files. And this is then new work that you're asking about. Um, so I guess my concern here is, is the redirection of those retaining walls um, further into the resource area. So and I, I guess I'd like to understand the justification for that one on the bottom. So, yeah. Yeah. So the, the one on the bottom, um, is that is the steepest part of our property. Okay. Uh, and that is the only part of the property that's continuing to erode. Um, so David actually came out and saw it with me uh, last end of last summer. Um, and so the rest of the walls are on less steep areas and they're holding up the, the property had been eroding for many years before we bought it. And that particular area, because we didn't extend that sort of the wall below the proposed wall, that area, the soil's just running off um, and it's not stabilized and it is the steepest area. And so that was sort of the best way we thought that we could stabilize it um, in a way that also fit with the existing walls and the visuals. And we could put, we can put a new tree there. Um, we just wanted to stabilize it in a way that would prevent more erosion. Um, we, we've tried, we tried a number of different plants over three seasons and it just didn't, they didn't take. Um, and so that that's purely to try to stabilize the hillside because that's the only part that's still unstable. And I'll, I'll add to that, um, when we say it is the, the steepest part of the property, it, it's the steepest part now, right? The rest of it was terraced by by yeah. this big project. Uh, that area wasn't terraced. Um, and and obviously it shows with the fact that we're, we can't get anything to, to grow there. Um, and, uh, and so the addition of those walls further into the resource area is really meant to, uh, to address and, and further stabilize. Okay, then I, I have another question. The relocated tree, was that one of the mitigation trees from the original project? No, that was- No, it was an original tree that was there. No, it was an, actually, it's an additional one, we added it. But it wasn't part of, of the, the, the 2021? It was not part of the initial plans, um, in the initial tree planting plans from 2020 or 2021. Um, we added an additional tree after getting 
permit after getting the order of conditions yes yeah. after, after getting the, the the certificate of compliance or whatever in between the two when we were still open and i was still reporting plants to david every okay. year I, I and, and was like... that to replace something that no no it was just separate the yeah. reason i'm asking is because you're proposing to relocate it outside of our jurisdictional area and if it was a mitigation planting we would want it within our yeah, jurisdiction. it was not a mitigation plan. okay okay and then my final question is it looks like your new wall that you're proposing might be in a right-of-way or an easement so it is it does go yeah. slightly over the easement um one of the walls we did put in in the last round was also over the easement we are aware of the consequences should the town have to do construction on that um but it does seem the best way to accommodate everything uh that we're looking at um, and the town's okay with that you've already so uh... we've we've reached out to engineering um david suggested that we did and so i did as soon as david uh we haven't received any response. I don't know that a null response means, you know, tacit approval in this case or not. Um, but, but as Eliza said, right, there is already hardscaping that that traverses uh, that sewer easement. Right, um, but it looks like it's much less. A you know, if I'm looking at the left hand side, which is what's there now. Well, so what I would say is this: um, the there's one wall that that transects there's an existing wall that transects the entire easement uh we would be adding um uh, another one or i guess two lengths of wall that transect that easement all of which would be in a relatively close proximity i, I can't tell the scale maybe about 10 feet um and so if there were a reason why the town needed uh to uh let's say dig up that sewer line which would be tremendously difficult but 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 if that were to happen um i i would argue that the proposal doesn't result in any more uh significant of uh disturbance during that process if that makes sense because there would already be wall that would have to be pulled up and this would just be sort of in addition to it and and, and i don't know if there's an argument to be made that like having the 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 site be more stable in that area would would be a, a helper or a hindrance um if again if that that entire sewer line needed to be dug up and then my final my final comment and i'll go to the commission um you're proposing to remove two trees and then add four trees um based on our current regulations because the size of the trees you're removing are greater than 10 inch in diameter, you actually have, I mean, unless the commission says otherwise, and you know, we, we can talk about that as a commission, um, it's four trees per tree. Oh, I of the size they are. Mm -hmm. Is that new? Cause I went back and found the. Did you check our, our regulations online, which are five? I thought I did. I yeah. I may have used the older ones. Yeah, the older ones may have been different. Okay. So we we updated our regulations in March of 2023 and they are on the website. And there's a little table there. Now, okay. sometimes the commission, if if we, you know, if we feel that's too many trees for the site and we can't, we, you know, we will make, you know, uh different decisions, you know shrubs and trees or whatever but i'm just saying it's not consistent with our current regulations okay. i i'm sorry i must have used the older ones from that's our okay. last that's line. okay that's uh, okay i would i would request that the commission consider allowing us to use fewer than four trees per tree i'm happy to have you know some of you come look at the property but the ones that we put in in 2020 have gotten huge um and they look great they're doing super well but in terms of where all the walls are there's not a lot of other good areas to put them um we're obviously putting in more shrubs and we've put in trees we continue to try to add them where we can um but i'm not sure we could accommodate eight yeah so i think uh and and just one note um the the trees that are coming out are, are both invasives uh one's a norway maple one's a sycamore maple uh, the Nora maple has already failed at the base of its trunk, so it's coming down whether or not we do it or or or, or it doesn't or it doesn't. <laughs> um, and um, 
And the whole idea of having this additional stabilization is to uh, provide more area for um, shrubs and, and bushes to, and to be trees. successful. Um, so I, I'm very happy to that that we would work with with David or, or whomever on on the commission to you know figure out the the appropriate planting um, to to you know replace those those two uh, uh, invasives. Um, I know one of our neighbors is on the on the phone too, and and he can certainly attest to um, he, how, he's how, on the other side of those trees. <laughs> how quickly how quickly they're growing. Um, hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to the commission. Are there commissioners who would like to make a comment or ask a question for this RDA? Tell me if I'm missing anybody. I see Nathaniel, you have your hand up. Thanks. Um, I was just going to say, in terms of the tree replacement, we do sometimes consider uh, shrubs instead. So I think going that direction, I'm comfort comfortable with that. In terms of the easement issue, I don't think that's really something we are are to be concerned about. And I guess I would also add that if the town was going to come in and dig up that line, they'd have they'd be filing a notice of intent probably to do that work. So we would deal with with that at that time uh, anyways. But I'm just yeah, I think overall I'm I guess this is this was this file as an RDA and I guess first tried to get David's approval and then he bumped it up to us. I just wonder if is it I'm curious as to what the other commission members think, if we can handle this with a determination or if we want a full NOI on this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm you the, brought that I'm up. I'd like, I'd like, I'm on the fence too, because it's a lot of building. It's further in to our resource area. Generally, those are not what we choose to, you know, permit as RDAs. Um, but, you know, I'm open. I'm on the fence too. Brian? Uh, oh, wait, Chuck. I think Chuck was first and then Brian. Okay. Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, so I was just wondering if um, you knew how close, and this is to one of the, one of the applicants, how close the um, proposed work is to Spy Pond. Um, so I don't, I don't see a measurement there. That's... Yeah, so the, the 100 Oh boy, we're moving. <laughs> um, the, the hundred foot is that dashed orange line. Yeah, so I know where that is, but but I'm talking about that retaining wall that you're proposing. Uh, that uh, to me looks like it's creating some sort of like I don't know viewing viewing area uh, next to the stairs. Yeah, so that, I would. That seems to be the closest point. Sure, and I would estimate just based on the drawings and based on having been out there that it's maybe 30 feet down from the 100 foot, so 70 feet from the pond. That's 70 feet, okay. Um, those those retaining walls, do, are you are you proposing to do the same type of work? Are these going to be, you know, footing, rebar, poured in place, uh, you know, something okay. more substantial with equipment? So, um, probably not with equipment because I don't think we can get equipment there. Uh, I don't think it's possible. Um, I think that all of the walls would be the same freestanding material with the exception of the outside of the staircase, the part of the, the most bottom part of that proposed staircase, because that's freestanding. Um, and so that I think we would need to do stone and mortar. So yeah, just to be just just to clarify, yeah. we would use the same material that has been used for the rest of the retaining walls. Which is the the blocks, which uh, blocks with adhesive and geo grid, um, with the exception of what I call the the outside, which in this diagram is the bottommost wall that lines the steps, uh, and that would be field stone uh, and mortared, which matches the other staircase we put in under our past NOI on the other side of the property. Okay, uh, so I, I also had some concerns about working in the easement without permission i appreciate that you didn't uh, that you did reach out um but I'm, I'm i'm not so happy that they didn't they didn't respond i do expect you to get the same answer uh but i think it's important to at least let the you know engineering department know um so i, I know that in the town i work for you do have to get permission and maybe that's where we adopted it from, but 
that's one of the requirements. So I'm not sure if that matters. And then I wasn't on the site visit. If if this if there's an opportunity to go out there, I I think that would be um, something that I would uh, be involved in uh, going out for a site visit. I'd, I'd like to see this. Um, you know how it how it looks and how it how it reacts to the property would be good to know and and help me uh, a little bit. That's all I had, Susan. You're, you're Thanks, welcome. Chad. Thanks. I'm going to go back to Brian and then Nathaniel has his hand up again. Brian. Yeah, so, yes, uh, this may be obvious, but I guess we have some discomfort about working close to the uh, resource area. But on on the flip side, the countervailing uh, thought is there's erosion happening now, which may worsen if this isn't addressed. Uh, I don't know if there's an obvious alternative solution that doesn't involve working in this zone, but I'm just trying to state, uh, is, is this sort of the balance that we're looking at that we need to stop this erosion or that will have a harmful effect on the, on the water uh, versus building in, in a zone that which we prefer not to and trying to balance those two out. Thank you, Brian. That's a good point. Nathaniel? <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to uh, come back to this easement issue since uh, Chuck brought it up again. Um, again, I don't think, I mean, it's it's nice that we're asking them to, to, or that we're suggesting to the applicant that they check with engineering. But again, we're not concerned with whether or not they have the right to do that. That's a property rights issue, which is not, not our concern. And in case people are still worried about that, our order of conditions Form standard condition says the order does not grant any property rights or any exclusive privileges. It does not authorize any injury to private property or invasion of, 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 of private rights or property rights. So in other words, we leave that's to that essentially says we leave to the town who owns the easement and the property owners to work out that property rights issue. Thank you for that clarification. Daniel. Thanks. Anybody else um, from the commission have a comment? Um, Mike? Yeah, just a quick note. I would also agree that a site visit would be in, in order here just to get a better sense of what's out there and what might be out there. I'm just endorsing that idea. And I wonder if a site visit would help us decide if this is an RDA or an NLI as well. Um, because it may be hard to decide that when we don't put feet on the ground. I know that helped that helped me personally on another project we're talking about today, um, 459 Mystic, which I thought might have been an NOI and it's an RDA. So um and, and I just to to comment, I we're happy to have any of you out anytime for a site visit. You're absolutely okay. welcome. Um I I would just suggest that since we just had a full NOI and we just closed it with basically very similar work, that I would hope that the commission would consider the RDA um, as, you know, we've, we've done a lot to this property that I think David was really happy with when he saw it. Um, and I know Emily was happy with it before that. So I, I would hope that the commission would consider that. Great. And if David was here tonight, maybe that would, you know, assuage my uncertainty but um yeah because because I haven't been on site myself and the rest of the um, commission has not so um would you be willing um to uh, to have a continuation so that uh, several members of the commission could have a site visit and then um, um we would continue this till April 4th so yes and what we would love to request is the approval just for the corner of the addition that's in the resource area because we're submitting to ZBA on April 1st to go in front of them April 30th. So I want to make sure that that tiny little corner is okay with you guys before we move forward with ZBA. Um, and we'd really like to do that in April. And that's the second story addition. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, correct. It's the it's a two story addition. Two story addition. With and how many square feet was that? Can you remind us? Uh, it's the the totals like eight hundred and twenty one, I think, which is why okay. we're going into VA. Um, and so I, I I can't remember how many feet of it is in the hundred foot, but it's very small. Yeah, that, it's drawn out to uh, it's ninety two feet away from the resource area. 
So that just that little corner. Um, so uh, we're completely okay with a continuation for the walls and the stairs pending a site visit, but we would like to move forward with the ZBA, but uh, it's filing by April 1st, if that's possible. Can I just ask, is that addition, I assume you're having a foundation dug for that? Yes. Or is it on tubes or on? Uh, no, it's a, it, it, yeah, it's, it's going to be a, a, I believe it's a poured foundation. Okay. So they'll be digging out dirt, uh, They'll be digging it out and things. Okay, yeah. I'm not seeing any erosion control, sedimentation control, you know, or uh, fencing or something. Yeah, we're going to put in the the same. We had the barriers before from our NOI, the the sort of big yeah. tube. the okay. tubes. Yeah, uh, and, and we'll put that in too because we're taking out the the old bricks. You see those purple X's? Those are all bricks, and that's just outside of the hundred foot. So we're taking those out. Hmm. So we're going to put erosion control in. We have. Um, a lot of interest in not having dirt run down the hill. Uh, so we're definitely right, going right. to- Of your walls. Yeah, we don't want it in the pond as much as you don't either. So it should, yeah. should just be in the plan. Um, so procedurally- oh, we to put temporary oh. controls onto the plan. Yeah. We'd yeah, like to totally the emotion controls or even, you know, just a little narrative about it. All right, well, so um, so so just just for everyone's sake, um, can, can you help me understand, is it- most valuable to you to have the erosion control at the bottom of the hill prior, like right at the bottom, which is where we had it before, uh, blocking anything from getting into the pond or um, at the top uh, of the walls um, to, to block any potential runoff from even getting into that hundred foot zone. Well, I think that, so if, if you asked us to approve just the, the two story addition, you would move it up to just in front of that work. But if we approve the whole um, you know, project, you're right. I mean, you usually put the erosion control, you know, so far away from the from where the work is, like 20 feet. So I don't know if it would be at the bottom, but that that may be the best spot for it. Um, but we could figure that out on the on the on the site visit if needed. So but yes, we anyway. do plan on erosion controls. For for sure. Yeah. So what is procedurally, maybe I'll ask Chuck and Nathaniel. So we have this RDA for this entire project. If if we approve part of it, do you, we just say we're approving part of it? it? And that's okay? They don't have to resubmit without the walls? Well, I, I'm... Yeah, I, I think feel like if you... Go ahead, Chuck. I feel like if you approve part of it, I mean... It, it seems to it's hard to approve part of it without thinking about you're going to approve the whole project. So it would be hard to turn this into a notice of intent after the fact. That's that's the only thought that came to mind when when it was mentioned. Um, hard so, or unusual. Let me put it that way. Sure. Um, so my question would be then it if I guess I would like some assurance that if this ends up as a notice of intent, that you would still be comfortable approving it pending us going through the process so we can feel confident going forward with ZBA. I don't think we need final approval from you to go to ZBA, but I, I think we'd just like to be comfortable that we are on the right track. So I have, uh, so we could, so for the commission, we could approve the two-story addition um, for the ZBA. And then we go and do the site visit. If it's a notice of intent, we'll just have the notice of intent for the stairwell, which will take a few, a little bit to uh, kind of put together. And we could continue with the RDA for the proposed two-story addition. It will give us two permits at the end of the day, but the addition is uh, 92 feet away. Yeah, that's what I was sort of thinking, trying to divide it up. I was going to ask Eliza. So, so you're saying you don't need a sign off. The ZBA is not asking for a sign off from us. It's we more haven't, that you. We haven't sorry. filed with them, so I don't. Uh, what? I don't know if it's okay. No, I don't. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. I I I, I wasn't sure if, if that was an absolute requirement, but what yeah, I guess I just, just my I, I agree with Chuck that we split split it off uh, and consider this RDA is you're just filing for the proposed two-story addition and you're withdrawing the the staircase um, 
uh, you know, moving the staircase and moving those trees and then could sign off on a determination that that's okay and then deal with the stairs either as a continued uh, determination proceeding or uh, as a order notice of intent and order of conditions. Mm -hmm. I, I think that sounds reasonable to us, assuming we wouldn't need to file a second RDA if, after a site visit, if you're all comfortable with it. And well, I think wait, so. So wouldn't there be another RDA if we're, no, uh, we're it would taking just be a a, it plan would be change, a like a plan that. change to the original something RDA like if we add the the plantings and the walls? Is that what you're saying? That would be the procedure. I guess we're, we would be issuing two determinations potentially. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what one, I thought. One, one request, which we've no, I've never heard of it happening before, but it's it's kind of like a partial certificate. Of they wouldn't come back in and uh, just modify the existing determination. Is that is that as how about, unheard of? How about, <laughs> how about how about we just do a little bit of a straw poll? This isn't a vote, but just a straw poll on how comfortable. The commission is with the proposed addition. And if you get a level of comfort from that as the applicant, that this sounds okay for you to move forward with ZBA, then we can keep this as one RDA. Um, that would be, that would work great. Okay. Do, is is that okay, Nathaniel and Chuck? Can we, sure, yeah. Little straw yeah, polls, yeah. not, it's not a vote. Okay, I, I am comfortable with the proposed addition if there are appropriate erosion controls, I would like to see them on the plans. Um, and um, I'd like to know the square feet of intrusion, even though it's small, I'd like somebody to calculate that for me. Um, but otherwise I would be comfortable with this as an RDA. Um, Nathaniel? Yes, the same, exactly what you said. Brian? Yes, agreed. David White? I'm with Susan this one. Okay, Chuck? Yes. Mike? Sounds good. Okay, so you're getting a sense that the commission is, is okay with that. And I think that that can help you when you present this to ZBA. And I think that the commissioners I'm hearing need a site visit um, before we can decide if this whole project is really an RDA or an NOI. Um, okay. Kind of Sounds get our great. feet there. Okay, so I will have either Ryan or David, probably David, um, coordinate with you and us to to get a site visit before um, the next April fourth. And I see we have. Um, I, I do need to open this for public comment, so I will open it for public comment now. And I see um, Bob Bose has his hand raised. You're welcome to unmute. And please state your name and your address. Yes, my name is Bob Bose. I'm the abutter to the south side of this project. I'm at 26 Lakeview Street. Uh, I will not be available to attend the April 4th meeting, so I appreciate the chance to speak tonight. Um, this project is mostly impacting my property, my wife and I. Uh, the stairway becomes closer, the walls become closer, there's an addition, but I will tell you that I find Ian and Eliza to be terrific neighbors, very responsible. They've done a very nice job with their home. We would certainly support their efforts in doing this. But I want to make sure that you understand the erosion here is really a major problem. Uh, we've been in our home for almost 30 years. The storm drain at the end of PBD Road is not sufficient to carry the runoff. So once that overflows, it goes through Keen and Eliza's yard goes down through my yard and goes right into the pond. And it's just a big mud pile. The work they've done so far has helped to mitigate that. But clearly, I think this change will do a far better job long term. Thank you very much. That's that's helpful information. Appreciate it. Are there any other um, members of the public who would like to speak about this hearing? Don't see any hands up. And I, am I missing anybody, Ryan? No? Okay. No. So I'm going to close the public hearing um, portion and go back to the commission. It, are, there, are there any further comments or we'll entertain a motion for continuation? I make a motion to continue to April 4th. Second. Chuck. 
Chuck and second by Nathaniel. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll take a roll call vote. Um, Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildeskane. Yes. David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Chuck Taroni. Yes. And Susan Chapnick says yes. So we'll see you on the 4th, but before that, David will be in contact to arrange a site visit. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Chuck Taroni for the next hearing. Great. So next on our agenda, we have a notice of intent for two reservoir roads. This is a continuing hearing from March 7, 2024. Um, we just had a few final items uh, that the commission needs to go over, and I'm going to ask staff if they have any updates on this project. So, uh, Ryan, did you, uh, and that may, they may not, so, which is perfectly fine. Uh, yeah, we did receive some supplemental information from uh, Rich Kirby. Uh, and that was dated, what's the date on that? Uh, March 13th. Uh, so they have revised the planting plan, which includes invasive uh, plant management plan. Uh, there were some updates on the stormwater management compliance uh, and vegetation replacement. Um, they did provide a table showing the, the tree replacement requirements, um, which I believe covers the item, just about covers the items that the commission had asked for at the last meeting. Uh, we do have Rich Kirby as well as Nicole Ferrara from LEC uh, this evening to also speak to that, so. That's great. All right, Rich, I see that you're you're here. Can you bring the commission up to date with this application uh, or or Nicole, sure. whichever? Um, I'm happy, happy to jump in. Rich Kirby from LEC, uh, Nicole Ferrara from our offices here tonight, along with the applicants, Linnea and David Bergeron. Uh, at the last hearing, we presented the uh, addition project off the rear of the house, along with a reduction in the uh, size of the driveway. Um, net increase in impervious area is right around 316 square feet. We have a pretty robust planting plan that uh, Holly Samuels put together. She's also here tonight. And uh, the planting plan includes uh, 735, I believe, square feet of restoration behind the uh, proposed lawn edge adjacent to the garage. Um, we also have a stormwater infiltration trench proposed at the drip line of the proposed addition, as well as on two sides of the garage where the entire roof will be directed, uh, runoff from the entire roof will be directed to that infiltration trench. At the last hearing, the commission wanted a little bit more detail about regulatory compliance with regard to the stormwater management. Um, we provided that in the uh, March 13th letter, um, talking about how uh, a number of things, number one, not only will the existing roof area, or sorry, not only will the uh, proposed addition roof area be directed to this trench drain, but the way the roof line is, a portion of the existing roof will also be directed to that trench drain. Of course, we have the trench train for the uh, existing uh, garage that's behind the house. And by way of implementing Holly's planting plan, we're also reducing the um, runoff from, from the site. In other words, we're changing the cover type from lawn to a more vegetated land, which is also going to reduce the, uh, the runoff uh, rate from the site. Uh, also, the runoff that is coming off the site, for the most part, is clean runoff. It's coming off a roof. Um, you know, the, the more um, sandy, uh, dirty water, if you will, that comes off the driveway. We're actually reducing the footprint of the driveway. So we're re reducing the amount of uh, dirty runoff, if you will, uh, that comes off the site. And with respect to an O&M plan, you know, we, we talked about this amongst the team and struggled with it because the, the only thing you really have to do is just keep the trench drain free of, you know, leaves and other organic debris. We thought we could entertain that as a special condition, or if the commission, you know, wanted something more formal, we could, um, as a special condition, prepare an o &M plan that simply states all trench drains shall be kept free of uh, leaves and other organic debris. Um, what else? We talked a little bit about the revised planting plan. I'm going to get let Holly get into the uh, weeds, if you will, on that. But basically, we increase the number of trees. Holly justifies the use of some of the landscape cultivars on the plan. 
And we also have an, an invasive species management plan. And of course, reminding the commission that we fully commit to supervise the installation and monitor the success of the restoration area for a three-year period. So I think that I think that covers it all. Holly, if you want, if it, I can happy to share my screen with your planting plan, or if you want to share your screen, that's fine too. What's your preference? Uh, I have it, so I can um, I can do that. Okay, great. If I can share, this is Holly Samuels, Holly Garden Design. Let me let me pull it over my big screen. I don't know if that'll make a difference. It'll be easier for. What well, can't do that. Hold on. Figure out where it is. Yeah. While you're doing that, David Kaplan, I see has arrived for the record. What time is it? 8 14 p.m. Thank you. 8 12. Okay, got it. Thanks. Can you see my screen now with the plan? No, not quite. You can't. All right, let's see what happened. Um, share. There we go. Are there? All right. Yep. Okay, so um, I um, I made the lawn area a little smaller. We added in another another tree of the liquid ambar um, and moved things over a bit. I changed the ground cover uh, to a native ground cover. Which is a, a Cybaldiopsis tridentata. Uh, a good sunny area ground cover. And then we I made a sort of meadow planting around this vegetable on an herb raised bed. Um, I do have a couple of roses that are existing on site that are of sentimental value because they were there from the, the when the parents owned this property. And um, so we'd like to keep those in. I added in a couple of um, uh, Aronia melanocarpa back here by the garage. Uh, so two additional shrubs. And um, I think those were all the changes uh, that I made to the plant. All of these uh, meadow plantings are native, uh, native plantings, not cultivars, native species. Um, in this area, I have the table for the tree placement and, um, and justifying the use of native cultivars. I changed the, the dogwood to a, a a Cornus Florida, um, pink flowering dogwood. And uh, and th these three kinds of cultivars are all have um, similar environmental value because they, they're not changing any kind of flower form or leaf color. You know, they should, they just should still have the same basic value. Um, and uh, invasive management plan, um, mostly by mechanical movement. The, the biggest danger here is the Japanese knotweed, which is right alongside the edge of the bikeway, is incurring a tiny bit into the property, um, but the, the homeowners are, are committed to managing that as it's coming, if it moves into the property. Um, if there needs to be some kind of uh, chemical use, uh, it would be done by a, a licensed applicator using some kind of uh, product that's approved for wetland use, such as uh, glyphosate, aquanit, or garland beef, or trichopyr, depending on when it's done in the season. Um, and I think uh, I think that's all I have. I didn't, the restoration plan um, hasn't changed. So those are the changes I made. Any questions? I'm, I'll, I'll leave this up. Sure. Uh, I didn't know if Nicole was going had a had something to say, and then we could just go to the commission after that. If not, we can go to the commission now. Sure. So, um, I know Susan has her hand up, but I just I did want to say that I'm I don't think that I would be comfortable, um, you know, approving the notice of intent with a list of herbicides that could be used. I think that if if that was the case, um, they would need to reach out to the conservation commission and and see if um, and see if we wanted a permit for the amount of uh, for the amount of work that they are proposing for that round of treatment. And with that, I'll turn to uh, Susan Chapnick. 
Well, you just took the words out of my mouth because I was going to make a comment about chemical use. And I know that that, that might be um, different in Lexington, Holly, where you work, but in Arlington, we, we don't approve herbicide use in resource areas um, generally. I mean, there are, are specific instances where we do, um, but uh, we have to review it very carefully and then condition it very carefully. And um, I'm thinking you're better off if you just have a little bit of Japanese knotweed to not even think about that right now and try to keep just, you know, cutting it back and, you know, you know, keeping it at, a, at, a, at bay that way. And if it gets to the point where you feel you need her, besides, you'd have to come back to the commission um, to ask for that. Okay. Maybe. Can we, yeah. uh, can can I uh, modify this plan and just remove that um, that section? Sure. We could just make that a condition uh, if okay. we move yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't. Yeah, we'd make that a condition. Actually, it's one of our standard conditions that okay. we don't allow use of pesticides or herbicides or rodenticides, mm -hmm. chemical rodenticides within the resource areas. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know that. Yep. So that's all set, Susan. Uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I was going to say it, it probably would not hurt to revise the plan as well, Holly, even if it's a condition, just so we don't have any confusion. So I, I will. Yeah, I I can, make... I'll do that. Thanks. That'd be great. Um, and then I was going to ask, are these new plantings uh, rabbit proof? I think last time your ra rabbit <laughs> rabbit <laughs> um, not, res resistant rabbit proof. <laughs> <laughs> no, resistant was the word I was looking for, because um, I know you, you highlighted your last planting plan that you uh, we're trying to uh, pick plants that were rabbit, quote unquote, rabbit proof. Uh, yes, they are uh, mostly, I think, except for the New England aster. But once the other plants are are uh, are around it, they should be better in the meadow area. They they'll keep the rabbits away. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks. And then uh, just the rest of the commission, I comment. I'm comfortable with Rich's suggestion about having a. O and M for the stormwater maintenance to be a standard condition rather yeah. than doing a plan for all of that. It seems a little overkill. And can may I ask? Oh, then, uh, um, yeah, sure. go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, no, go ahead. Holly. I, I just was, I just was going to ask if the if the modification of the plan requires me to make new copies for everybody, or can I just submit that to the office? Um, in is that um, can it be submitted electronically, or how does that? Absolutely. I think so. Yeah. Just electronically. Yep. Yeah, that would be okay. fine. Okay. Thank you. We'll we'll answer There's for David question. tonight. Yeah. So since he's not here, I'll just add that. Any other uh, comments from uh, the Conservation Commission? I I think that David had a question about fees. Do you know anything about the did he talk to you about that, Rich? About I'm sorry. What fees? Filing fees. Filing fees. I'm. Um, I just got. I just saw an email. This is the from first him. I've heard of it. Okay. Yeah, he had a question about the uh, the state fees, but I noted that uh, when DEP issued the file number, there was no comment about any issue with the fee on their end. So. That's yeah, it's work money. associated yeah. with the single family house, so it's one ten times one point five, which is um, one sixty. Five divided by two plus and minus twelve fifty. Right, David. David was uh, under the impression it was uh, like per work on, like per each work on single family house. If that makes sense, like because there was yeah. Uh, I mean, how I suppose. So what? Why don't we just this? This is office discussion. I think that we could just have a condition to resolve this between you and David prior to uh, issuing. I mean, okay. Yeah, you but know, can you can you close? A hearing the DEP is fine with their money they received. It's, okay, the, the, yeah, they issued a file number. Yeah, that's yeah, what if, that's a, if, that's a good if I could tip, typically, we you know, if the project is an addition project, um, that's usually the activity. Mm -hmm. Everything else that we're proposing is, is mitigation, so you know, for that project. So, okay. you know, I'm okay that, with that's it. how we've with interpreted that. it yeah. in the past. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sounds um, we'll square it away with David. Great. I'll make Any a motion other? to 
close the public well, 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 we need to oh. see if anyone here wants oh, to sorry. anyone attending Have tonight's meeting has yeah. a comment okay. or uh wants to ask a question about this uh this application at uh, two reservoir road please raise your hand you can use the uh, reactions button to raise your hand or you can just raise your hand and wave at on the screen seeing none uh nathaniel comment a motion i'll make a motion to close the public hearing in a second second all in favor aye roll call vote Yes. Oh. Daniel says aye. Nathaniel says aye. Okay. Uh, David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildiscame. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Did I forget anyone? I hope not. Okay. Any so the conditions that I have are a condition to a special condition to um, trench drain shall be kept uh, free of leaves and organic debris. There'll be no use of pesticides uh, on the property to control invasives. And was there one other which I didn't write down? Oh, and the and the plan will be updated and uh, emailed to David. Morgan at the office. The planting plan. The yeah, planting plan. plan. Yeah. Yep. With that, any comments or motions? Um, I have. Well, Go ahead. Can I make one? So, so the monitoring um, of the restoration area was for three years, which is great. Can can I make a a special condition that we get an annual report after each growing season? So maybe late fall. Um, on how that's doing. I think I think that's fine. We I think we actually committed to that in the notice oh, of intent. Oh, did you? I might have missed it. Thanks. Yeah, Rich. no, that's fine. Um, that that's typical. Thank you, Rich. Okay. Any I'm other comments then. or motions? I'll make a motion to approve under the act and the bylaw with the conditions as discussed. Second. I'll second. Uh, Susan second. Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildiscame. Yep. Daniel Stevens. Yes. David White. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. All right, you're all set. Uh, this is, uh, if you want to find out when that uh, will be issued, you have to reach out to David next week when he's in the sure. office. Or actually, he's in the office tomorrow too. But... Um, he said he's a little sick, so maybe next week would be better. All okay. right, Rich. Thanks, everyone. And I everyone. wanted to Thanks. thank Rich, Rich and team. I just want to thank you for a very comprehensive um, permit submittal and, and being so responsive to our requests, especially addressing climate change, because often we don't get that. People just forget about that section of our regulations. So I yep. personally happy to do it. it. Thank it's you. important. Thank it's you. It's important. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Thank you. All right, here we go. So our next on the agenda is a request for determination for 459 Mystic Street. This is a continuation of a hearing for the conservation commission uh, last heard on March 7, 2024. Uh, Susan Chapnick will be uh, presenting this project to the commission. Susan. Okay, so um, we heard this uh, last time on 3-7. Um, and this public hearing is to consider a request for determination of applicability for the construction of an addition and a deck at 459 Mystic within the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands. It's also within the 200 riverfront, um, which we had neglected to put on that notice. Um, the, um, the continuation was because the commission requested that the applicant provide some mitigation um, we recommended mitigation in terms of vegetation um, along uh, the river as mitigation for working in riverfront area. And the applicant has given us this proposal. Do we have um, the, the applicant, the architect here tonight, or should I present this? I don't know who's here. I believe I saw Scott Grady was in attendance. Scott's here. Great. Scott? If you're there, 
can you unmute and tell us what you're proposing? Maybe not. Yeah. Do you see him? Okay. What what's, what's the name? I'm on the attendance list. Scott, Scott. Grady? No, Scott okay. Horsley and Scott or Oran. Okay. All right. I, will... I definitely saw him like five minutes ago. <laughs> okay. Maybe he has connection problems. Well, he's um, going to another hearing. Yeah. Anyway, um, it, he they're proposing um, several native species. We gave them a list, um, viburnum, um, some flocks, et cetera. And you can see um, they're in clusters and groupings along the riverfront area. Um, this is a channelized river and there is a bunch of erosion in certain areas. So uh, vegetation hopefully will help with that. Um, to me, it seemed like a robust um, vegetation plan for the very small amount of work that they're doing, which we discussed last time. I don't know if any commissioners have any comments on this. Um, sure. I guess I'll just stop. <laughs> yeah, sure. so so th that's what my thought was too. I think that there's, there's a lot of planting there. Um, for that small amount of disturbance that we saw. So I was surprised that um, they proposed all this and, and I'm not sure if they got uh, any direction from David, but if they wanted to do less, because I saw the I saw the yard, it's quite big and there's a lot of erosion down by where that triangle points, I would be okay with it. But otherwise I'm, I'm pretty happy with this plan. And no yeah, one's here to I'm, speak to that anyways. Right. I'm very happy with it. I thought it was um, more than enough for, for the small impact in Riverfront. And I think it's going to really improve the the erosion and the, the habitat by the by the river. And I didn't know the name of this river. I had to ask, I asked David White, we had a discussion. This is Herbert Meyer Brook. I had guess I'd never come in contact with it before. So yeah. Okay. Anybody else um, have a I, yeah, I, I agree it's great. Um, uh, yeah, I do too. I'm, and I'm also astounded to hear Chuck say that there's too much mitigation. I hope that that makes them to meeting minutes. It's just like it like it to be a, <laughs> it the, like appro a the appropriate amount would be fine. The appropriate amount of mitigation. Okay. I, I guess, I guess yeah, I'd make a motion to close the hearing. Um, no, I, I, so I think we have to I, ask for. Um, Oh, sorry. Public comment. Yeah. Yeah, we have to ask for public yeah. comment. And unless David, you're making a comment or a second. Dave? Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but I would recommend you know some sort of um, plant protection fence oh, for their okay. establishment. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. been proposed or not, but those look like yummy plants. If I were a rabbit. Oh, you're you. That's a good <laughs> point. We'll tell Rabbits, them to yes. put up some temporary fencing. Um, that can be a condition of the of the RDA. But let me go to public comment now. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment or ask a question about this RDA for 459 Mystic? And somebody tell me if I'm missing anybody. I don't see anybody. I don't see anyone. No. Okay, I'm closing public comment. And now I will entertain a motion um, about this RDA. To close the hearing. Oh, I have to close the hearing. Sorry. Nathaniel. Yep, make a motion to close the hearing. A second. A second. Oh, I mm. think Chuck got it. Everyone's a second, that one. Yeah, okay. So we'll take a vote to close the hearing and then and then for the determination. Um, so Chuck Taroni. Yes. Mike Gildesgame. Yes. David White. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And the, and Susan Chapnick says yes. So we close the hearing and now we need to talk about um I have one condition um if we And here's uh, Scott Grady actually. <laughs> oh Scott, where are you? Uh, we close the hearing. Uh, Can we let him I don't think it doesn't so matter. I would just I say that it, say, right? we're ready yeah, to yes, go. There's I no know. 
So yeah, Scott, we I know you left peril. and right. We we already kind of closed the hearing and everybody said good things about your plantings. And the only recommendation was to put temporary fencing as plant protection, some temporary plant protection around where you're planting those because we're afraid the bunnies are just going to eat it all. And then you won't have anything that that stays there. So that was our recommendation. So um, this is an RDA, so I would say it's a positive or negative. So yes, we have jurisdiction, but no, no is the intent is required. Yes. With the, with the condition that they uh, fence the plantings till they're established. Okay, and so you're making a motion? Yes. Okay, so that's Nathaniel. I'll second it. That's David White. Any further discussion? Okay, I'm gonna take another roll call vote um, for this determination. Uh, Chuck Taroni. Yes. Mike Gildeskane. Yes. David White. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Susan Chapnick says yes. So Scott, you got your, um, your request Thank for determination you. is yes, that it's in jurisdiction, but no, you don't need an, an NOI, a notice of intent, and okay. that our only condition, and you will get you know, your paperwork on this from David or Ryan, would be to put some temporary fencing around the plantings. And we really appreciate you grouping uh, multiple areas of those plantings around the, the riverfront. We think that's going to be a, a good enhancement to the habitat as well as helping with some of the- Oh, great. Well, I was hoping to fulfill what your goals were. So. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Okay, thank you. you take care. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Chuck, for Thorndike Place. Okay. All right, so we're at Thorndike Place. So the notice of intent for Thorndike Place, this is continued from uh, March Chuck. 7th. Chuck, sorry, one suggestion. I think David's going to leave. Do you want to continue the 88 Coolidge and then David wouldn't have to come back? Assuming that that would be time. great. Uh, I'm easy, either way. So I will uh, I will uh, put this, uh, take up uh, 88 Coolidge and we have a request to continue this to April 4th uh, at the applicant's uh, applicant made that request and so could i get a motion to do that so moved second and a second thank you uh let's go through the roll call so mike gildas game yes susan chapnick yes david kaplan yes brian mcbride yes david white yes nathaniel stevens and yes and chuck Taroni says yes Okay, that's taken care of. And now we're gonna move on to Thorndike Place where David White is recusing himself of this hearing. We'll see you later, David. See you later. Okay. All right, so we have a notice of intent for Thorndike Place. It was continued from March 7, 2024, DP file number 91356. Notice of intent, though, next place. Um, the Conservation Commission will hold public hearings under the Wetlands Protection Act to consider the notice of intent for construction of a Thorndike Place, multiple, multiple family development on Dorothy Road in Arlington. So I have a few preliminary comments before we get started. The Conservation Commission received BSC's response first February 28th, 2024, and then reiterated those comments on March 13th, 2024 with more context. But the end result was that BSC um, wanted to let the commission know that they do not agree uh, to perform additional monitoring as requested. As the uh, as the standby uh, as the standby, the information provided they stand by the information provided. During the course of this hearing, the Conservation Commission will discuss that response. First, we will go into continuing our habitat discussion. Unfortunately, we don't have our peer review final documents on their review of the invasive management plan. So, at the end of this hearing, I'm going to ask the applicant if we could continue to April fourth 
so we can get that documentation and uh, complete the habitat portion of this application. What I want to do tonight is the, in the following order is the same as I did in the past. Uh, and for those of you who, are, uh, who have been here before, you'll be used to that, hopefully. Uh, the proponents will bring us up to date on where they are regarding the habitat, and I will ask them how much time they need, and if that time is reasonable, I'll allow it. Um, and then I will acknowledge the emails that has been sent so far, and then I'm going to ask staff for an update if there's one. I will ask the commission for questions and comments, and then I will ask anyone attending tonight's meeting if they would like to make comments. Once habitat is over, there will be time. Uh, we will continue our stormwater condition, uh, our stormwater discussion. So with that, I believe I saw BSC Matt Byrne here. I saw Dominic here. So whoever uh, whoever wants to speak uh, with that, um, please. And just um, just let us know who you, who's speaking uh, for the record. Sure. Uh, this is Matt Byrne, uh, senior ecologist with BSC Group. Um, I'll just address the updates to the planting plan, and hopefully we can kind of check off one box here. Um, we received an SWCA peer review comment letter on the night, on the morning of the last hearing. Um, and that had uh two i think it was two outstanding maybe it was three outstanding issues that um that they identified um and so on the we we tried to speak to those um uh, uh outstanding comments at the last hearing but um on the 12th of march we submitted a, a formal response to the swca letter um, and what we have done, if you'll recall, the response, um, there were, I think, eight comments, and uh, SWCA comment two was about the ISMP, the Invasive Species Management Plan, which we had submitted. They haven't fully reviewed. Um, so we just, we responded that that has been submitted, and we look forward to an opportunity to talk, talk that through uh, with the commission and our senior botanist, Tom. Uh, Groves, who prepared that. So I presume that that will be at a later date. Um, comment, SWCA comment three, they they stated no further comment was required. Same with uh, four. Their fifth comment um, stated that there, there were still multiple species that are not representative of the, the trees on the site um, in the proposed uh, woodland restoration area. So what we did was we took the the species list that that he uh, that the chase recommended and we changed everything so that the only species proposed for planting in the restoration area are are currently identified on the site. So that uh, we expect SWCA will will find to be suitable. Um, their, uh, their other comment that was, um, outstanding was that the revised planning plan, um, had some cultivars in the, in the landscaped areas between the buildings and so forth. We've replaced all of those. Um, and there does remain one, one cultivar on the, a low growing, um, shrub that I asked our landscape folks to just swap out with a low bush blueberry so that we we take everything off the table um, and I expect that SWCA will find that that um, that will resolve their their final comment there um, so I think that we have um, addressed everything that the uh, SWCA put on the table in their last comment letter received March 7th um, so as far as I can tell, the landscape planting plan is um, up to snuff. Mm -hmm. Matt, I had expected um, 
the slides from the invasive management plan again uh, with a little more detail is that not something that you were going to do I did not think you were going to accept the conversation about the invasive species management plan okay based on your comments of or, or David's comments um, asking for SWCA's um, final responses or, or res responses to our plan. Yeah. Chuck, I think I'd rather wait until we get SWCA's responses and do it once. But... Yeah, I was just going to ask. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we have consensus. Okay. So we'll wait for that response. Is there any other questions or comments? Uh, Matt, do you have anything else to update us on here? Um, just that the, the planning plan, I, I think, is solid and 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 should be a, a something we can move into the finished column so we don't need to talk about that anymore hopefully okay uh and turn to the commission and ask for any uh, any comments uh, if you could just raise raise your hand or let me know if you need to ask some questions susan chapnick um i'm i'm um pleased with the responses to swca comments um, and the changes that have been made from the, the cultivars to the non-cultivars. I like the idea of blueberries because I, I always like the idea of having some um, some seeds or berries as well um, for for the wildlife besides just you know ornament more ornamental plants. So I think that that's welcome. Um, so, so I'm just looking for um, our peer review of the invasive uh, management at this point. I'll echo Susan's comments. Anyone else on the commission? Yeah, I, I reviewed the plan myself. Uh, I thought uh, I thought that Matt. It, it, it was good. I like the comments that you made. I like the blueberry bushes. This is what you heard tonight. Um, I was <laughs> I was uh, hoping to move a little bit further on this at tonight's meeting, but I can see that uh, we're we're really waiting for that invasive management plan reply. So with that, I'm just going to open up the habitat discussion to anyone who's t attending tonight's hearing that would like to speak about habitat. Um, we're gonna hold off on any comments about stormwater until we take that up following habitat at the same meeting. So if you could just raise your hand, if you have a comment about the um, what you've heard so far tonight about the habitat discussion, we'd like to say. Seeing none, I I don't see any uh, comments out there. All right. Um, Actually, oh, I have I have a comment. Lisa, Lisa, I'm Fried, sorry. Um, sure. I just um, could, I heard could you just state about... your name for the record, please? Yes. And name and address for the record. Sorry. Um, my name is Lisa Fredman, and I live at 63 Mott Street. And what I can tell you is. I planted three blueberry bushes on my property a couple of years ago, and I have absolutely no blueberry bushes on my property now. The deer eat all of them. And so there are going to be no blueberry bushes on the Mugar property because there are deer all over the place and they're going to go there and eat them. So I would really recommend choosing a different bush rather than blueberry bushes. All right, Lisa, thank you for that comment. You're welcome. We don't have deer in our part of Arlington, so that's probably why where I we live. We have deer yeah. all no, I over hear the you. place. I hear you. Yeah, you know, there's... and they come over from Belmont, of deer in and I believe there also are deer that are nesting on the Mugar property. That's a good point. Um, I will say that that one of our, if this gets to that point, one of the conservation standard conditions for replanting has to do with survivability and over three years. So so there will be conditions on that. If that doesn't work, they would have to propose an alternate 
um, you know, shrub or bush that serves the same purpose to the environment. So I'll just say that, but it's, it's a good piece of information because why plant something that may not make it. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I agree. Okay. Any other questions about the habitat, about the planting that you've seen on the plan uh, for anyone that's attending tonight's meeting? Seeing none, I'm going to go back to the commission and I don't see any hands or comments either. So I think I'm just going to close off this habitat to the discussion for tonight and following our um, stormwater discussion, which will take up last for a continuation to our next meeting to finalize the habitat discussion. So at this point, um, stormwater questions. So uh, I don't know if the commission uh, wanted to discuss this first or just hear from the applicant. I've had some questions, but we wanted to uh, feel confident about uh, you know, the questions that came up and, and for our own self and our own uh, review of this project. And we had put a list together of things that we wanted and sent it to the commit, uh, sent it to the applicant, but they felt like um, the information that they provided meets the, uh, meets the Wetlands Protection Act stormwater standards and they're standing by that. So I don't know if any commission Commissioner wants to make a comment uh, on top of that because it, it really came out at our last uh, at our last meeting, uh, or actually between meetings. So the two letters, one on February twenty eighth, which first mentioned, and it was uh, mentioned again on March thirteenth, two thousand and twenty four. So, commissioners, do you have comments? I see Susan Chapnick's hands. I I think I would appreciate, even though I don't think we went through everything, I would appreciate if. The, the applicant and um, I, don't, I know that Hatch is in here, maybe you, you or I could represent what they wrote in an email just for just to get everybody up to speed. So the applicant provided a letter between the two meetings. Um, maybe they could just briefly review that and then we can briefly review what our um, peer reviewer said in an email to us because I think they're not here tonight. Just sure. to set the stage. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dominic, are you uh, available to do that? Do you have that letter? Dominic Aron um, Aronaldi yes. from PFC. Sorry. Making sure I was uh, off mute. Um, yes, Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group. Um, we actually have a presentation, a brief presentation I'd like to, to give. Um, if I could share a screen, it, it, it addresses those comments. Um, it's been a, a couple of hearings since we've discussed stormwater. Um, there's been a little back and forth. This can catch everybody up as well as um, really clarify some um, misunderstandings and some things that that we we think haven't been been fully represented. Uh, if I share, sure. Uh, the commission. I, I wanted more comments from the commission, but I think this is a good uh, a good review. Uh, does everyone agree? See some heads nodding, so that's great. Go ahead, Dominic. Uh, all right, everybody has that. Just the, the opening slide. Okay. So again, for the record, Dominic Rinaldi, uh, Senior Civil Engineer with BSC Group. Um, we'd like to talk about a little bit about the stormwater uh, for the site, kind of catch everybody up again and uh, move things forward. So a quick overview of, of some of the things we're gonna talk about. Um, the project does meet or exceed the standards set by the Mass Well and Protection Act uh, for reference WPA as Well and Protection Act for anyone who doesn't know. Um, the infiltration systems on site uh, were designed by BSC, uh, registered professional engineers, and the information that we based that on was uh, peer-reviewed test pits, test pits that were done um, in accordance with the Wellness Protection Act, as well as the comprehensive permit issued for the project, um, and they were peer-reviewed by the town-selected 
um, representative in Whitestone Associates. Uh, these test pits were performed last May of 2023 uh, in the spring when groundwater is, is uh, generally highest. And they were performed, and uh, we have all confirmed that groundwater conditions, according to the uh, USGS, were normal during last May. So there were no drought conditions. This is what you would expect in normal spring seasons in this area. Um, subsequent to that, um, and we have submitted in that, um, I believe it was February 28th uh, letter, um, some additional information. We did go back out and measure. Uh, groundwater levels uh, in the wells that we left on site and we did perform a fronter analysis as requested by the commission um, which confirmed our ground what the what we're using for estimated season by ground um, again our, all of these systems the whole stormwater management system was designed by registered professional engineers in the commonwealth of massachusetts um, the soils data was um, gathered by competent soils professionals as as described in the Loudness Protection Act and the Stormwater Handbook. Um, three things we really want to point out and, and stress for the commission. Um, again, we are using the most conservative, i.e. the highest estimated seasonal high groundwater that we found on site for all systems. This is not a one-time measurement. This is a redox feature which represents regular occurrence of groundwater. This is sort of, for lack of a better term, what MassDEP kind of considers the gold standard of estimated seasonal high groundwater. And we're using the highest one we found on site for all our systems to be exceptionally conservative. We are also using a conservative infiltration rate based on the soils we found, uh, but we chose to use a conservative infiltration rate. I'll get into that more in a little bit. And in an effort to, even though we don't have to, in an effort to uh, basically meet the Arlington bylaw, which again was waived in the comprehensive permit, we are using what uh, the Arlington bylaw defines as the NOAA 14 plus plus rainfall data, which is, is discernibly more than what we were required to under the comprehensive permit and massively more than what the baseline is for the Mass Wetlands Protection Act. Um, we did perform a groundwater mounding analysis in accordance with the WPA requirements, demonstrating that groundwater mounding is not an issue for these infiltration systems. And we do firmly believe that this design meets the Wellness Protection Act standards in all respects. Uh, again, uh, as far as the test pits were concerned, they were uh, concerned they were performed in May 18 and 19, 2023. I won't go through all of the wording on this slide, but basically they were again done in full compliance with what the comprehensive permit requirement requires, as well as what the Wellness Protection Act requires. They were witnessed by Whitestone uh, Associates, who agreed in all aspects with uh, soil types groundwater observations, um, and everything that we have presented. And that has been presented in their own report, own independent report, uh, exclusive of ours. In that 2023, we did eight test pits. These test pits were performed in the exact locations of these infiltration systems as required by the Wellness Protection Act. We have five test pits out towards the front of the site, towards Dorothy Road that are located within the small infiltration systems associated with the townhouse. Those are test pits one through five. We have test pit six off to the uh, east side of the site, which is located within um, what would be the bio, small bioretention area over there. And we have test pits seven and eight that are located within the large infiltration system uh, more in the middle of the site. Combined uh, with those two test pits, we also have test pit two, and I apologize for not switching up the numbering system, uh, that was performed in November of 2020 as part of the comprehensive permit system, and all of these confirm the same results. Um, you'll also see on this plan uh, off to the right, we've identified um, a project off Birch Street that was recently approved by the commission, um, and we can, we'll, we'll get into the groundwater uh, aspects of that in a little bit. Uh, again, these test pits were peer reviewed and, and witnessed by the town's uh, the town's chosen professional. Um, and we've confirmed that the USGS at groundwater conditions were normal. You can see from this, um, the only difference in the, the specific numbers of Whitestone's elevation calculations and BSCs is that Whitestone 
had to interpolate their ground elevations from the plans, whereas we actually surveyed those locations. Um, you can see from this that we are providing at at least the minimum two feet of separation to all of these systems, and in many cases, significantly more based on what we've actually observed in the field and the peer reviewer confirmed in the field. But that again is not what we're using for our groundwater elevation. We're using elevation four, which is slightly higher than the highest elevation we found in the field. Uh, again, as I said, and we included in that February 28th letter, uh, we performed a Frinter analysis based off of utilizing a USGS well, I believe in Lexington. And again, these numbers confirm that none of these te none of this test bit data would expect to see anything as high or higher than the estimated seasonal high groundwater elevation of four that we're utilizing. Um, these are the, the measurements I, I referenced. We went back out on February 15th, um, checked those wells. The, not surprisingly, the, the elevations were a little bit lower than what we saw in May. It's February, not May. Um, and representative, the test pit one is in one of the small infiltration systems. Test pit six, where, again, was in the bioretention area. And test pit seven is in the larger uh, system. And again, February was a normal month. So these are what you would expect. Um, we located redoxomorphic features, often called models or, or other uh, references. Um, these were confirmed by Whitestone, both BSC and Whitestone utilized uh, what the Mass Wellness Protection Act uh, references as competent soil professionals, um, both professional engineers and um, certified soil evaluators under the Title V system. Um, test pits three, five, and six showed redoxomorphic features with test pit five showing the highest elevation of redoxomorphic features at 3.2, at 3.98. So just a shade under four. Um, so for the ease of all of our lives, we utilized an elevation four because it's a nice round number. But again, uh, you can see from the estimate, the, the right hand column in this table is estimated seasonal high groundwater. And you can see that that 3.98 is significantly higher than the vast majority of what we saw out there and higher than anything. So again, we are utilizing the most conservative value that we found for all of our infiltration systems in an effort to make this a conservative, positive system for the area. Uh, these are some photos of test pit seven. There were some questions regarding uh, models noted in the Whitestone report. Um, Whitestone's report noted models between depths 39 and 54 inches, and they referred that as to likely perched, um, meaning that water at some point perched there for long enough to leave those models. However, as I've said previously, test pit seven went 60 inches deeper. And below that 54 inch depth, there were absolutely no models found. None in these pictures, none referenced by Whitestone, none seen by anybody. And in accordance with the procedures that are accepted by DEP, both for stormwater management and septic systems, a ground, a, in order to call an estimated seasonal high groundwater table using models or redox features, you have to see those models continue from the point where they begin all the way through the test pits. If they disappear like this, it is not ind indicative of a groundwater table. And rightfully, the town reviewer Whitestone in their report put estimated seasonal high groundwater at 108 inches below grade, which is where we put it. So again, this is, it is test pit seven, the models referenced are not even remotely close to a seasonal high groundwater. And that is confirmed with the town selected peer reviewer, not just us. As I said, we used conservative values in our design. What we found on the site and confirmed with Whitestone was loamy sand. So these are soil textures for people that aren't familiar with it, um, ranging from sand, which everybody understands, really permeable, way down all the way down to clay, which everybody understands is very much not permeable. We found the second most permeable soil out there, which is the loamy sand. However, based on our texturing of it, we felt that it was in the range of loamy sands, 
it was on the fine side, meaning it had a lot of finer particles in it. It was still a loamy sand, again, as confirmed by Whitestone. However, to be conservative, we chose to use a sandy loam infiltration rate. We went down a level. It's less than half the infiltration rate, which means our infiltration systems are bigger and more expensive than they could have, than we rightfully could have designed here. We chose not to do that, to be conservative, to plan not only for current conditions, but future conditions. Um, it is a very conservative value. I have already covered our estimated seasonal high groundwater, which varies, but all below four. But again, we used four to be conservative. And finally, our 24 hour storms, what we used to actually run through these models to size these systems, what we had to attenuate for peak flow. In the comprehensive permit, um, we agreed to use the NOAA 14 Atlas, which is which is, at the time was higher than what the town required under their bylaw. At the time, the town bylaw required uh, what's commonly called the Cornhill Atlas. It's a little smaller generally in this area than NOAA 14. And both of those are significantly larger than what the Wetlands Protection Act actually requires, which is TP40, which anybody who's used that knows it's data from the 50s. It's wildly outdated. So significantly larger. Again, as I said, in an effort to make a conservative system, what something that resulted in a larger system than we had to do for the comprehensive permit and a way larger system than we actually have to do under the Lens Protection Act, a larger, more expensive system that is better suited to handle both current rainfall and future rainfall. We used what the, what the town bylaw refers to as NOAA 14 plus um, plus. For people who aren't familiar with this, NOAA, the NOAA 14 Atlas gives you a range of numbers and it gives you the number that they suggest you use. And NOAA 14 plus plus is the highest number in that range. We're using a hundred year rainfall of somewhere around 11 inches. Um, that is a massive amount of rain. So again, the system we designed out here, we intentionally, optionally chose to design a very conservative system to maintain both current and future conditions and protect this site and protect the surrounding area with our stormwater management system. We performed a groundwater mounting analysis per the Wetlands Protection Act stormwater handbook requirements. The stormwater handbook doesn't require that you run this for 24 hours. There's been references to what the storm, to a 24 hour storm. The stormwater, the, well, the stormwater handbook requires that if you have less, if you have less than four feet of separation between your, the bottom of your infiltration system and your groundwater, uh, and your estimated seasonal high groundwater, and you're using that system to attenuate peak flows from a 10 year, 24 hour storm or higher, you have to perform a groundwater mounting analysis. The sentence that describes when you have to do this is not descriptive of how you have to do this. And I would reiterate again, as I said in that February 28th letter, that the groundwater methodology that we use, the exact methodology that we used, including how we determine the time span, which we explained in our letter, was previously approved and previously reviewed and approved during the comprehensive permit process by the town selected peer reviewer beta group who said explicitly that they reviewed this project for conformance with the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, there is a, a question that came up in the Hatch peer review about separation for the small infiltration systems associated with the townhouses to the foundations of those townhouses. Frankly, uh, we will just kind of agree to disagree with Hatch's uh, interpretation of subsurface features and setback requirements. However, we have been doing a little work on these and um, we have determined because what we're using is a modular system um, that we can reconfigure this system. We can shift it a little bit in location. We can basically, we're going to change the shape and we're going to change how the heights stack. And we can indeed achieve a 10 foot separation from those townhouse foundations because it seems to, if the commission wants that, we will absolutely do that. Um, we are more than willing to do that and, and check that box off. So in summary, and I tried to keep it brief, uh, hopefully I did, um, this project meets or exceeds all of the standards set by all 10 standards of the Wildlands Protection Act. 
Um, and we, BSC, uh, registered professional engineers in the Commonwealth of Mass, uh, designed the system. We utilized data that was peer reviewed um, by the town selected um, reviewer, Whitestone. We did all the test bits in compliance with the Wetland Protection Act stormwater standards, as well as the ZBA's comprehensive permit. Um, these test bits were installed in the spring when groundwater is expected to be highest, in which was specifically stated in the in the uh, comp permit that these test bits would be done in April or May. They were done in May, and again, we've confirmed that groundwater elevations were considered normal during by the USGS. Uh, this has been confirmed subsequently by our Frimter analysis and measurements. And again, we used very conservative values in an effort to make a system that will suit this site and protect the area, both under current rainfall and future rainfall conditions. Um, we perform the mounting analysis required by the Wellness Protection Act, and we stand by our statement that we truly believe that this project meets or in a, frankly, I will say exceeds this, the requirements of the 10 stormwater standards of the Wetlands Protection Act. So that is our presentation. Um, I don't know if you'd like me to stop sharing if you want, or that's up to you. Yeah, let's stop sharing right uh, at the moment. We might come back to this and we'll get back to uh, Susan, who uh, was asking a question when uh, when Dominic wanted to show us the slides and bring us up to date on um, that process that BSC has gone through on the stormwater for this project. Um, thank you, um, Dominic. I think that was very comprehensive and it helped bring us up to speed about what the issues were that we had um, back and forth. So I appreciate you, you taking the time to do that. Um, I would like to read into the record, um, if I can find it, uh, the email from Hatch in response to the applicant um, not, um, not, not uh, willing to monitor groundwater, which is what the Conservation Commission asked for. Um, in a, at a prior meeting, um, because I think it's important since they're not here that that we explain into the record what our um, what our peer reviewer said to do. So Ryan, do you have that, or, or do I need to find it? Is Ryan there? Uh, yeah. Let me let me grab that. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? It was an email. Um, I think it's in the materials. Yeah, it's it dated the uh, February fifteenth. Sorry, February. No, it's March. later than no, it's yeah, March. March March fifteenth. Yeah, thank I you. I have it in paper. Sorry, I have it in paper form. I can't screen share it, but yeah, I have it on. I'm, I'm I have two computers, and it's on my other computer, so I can't screen share it either. Hopefully, mm -hmm. Ryan can find yeah. it in the materials. But it, I I can start reading it. It just says it's to David Morgan. Okay. Hatch, Hatch, Hatch's recommendation is for recommended site modifications and collection of additional data. Oh, there we go. Right. Uh, right there. Yep. So I don't know which paragraph you wanted to refer people to, Susan, or just people could read it. Yeah, uh, I just I just it. wanted to um, say uh, th these were their their uh, final concerns. Um, it's there in bulleted point, the, um, let's see. So they, they're talking about setbacks and infiltration of historic fill. Um, Hatch remains, the third one is Hatch remains very concerned. There's appreciable groundwater infiltration based on flood risk. Um, Let's see. And while the applicant's groundwater readings meet the mass stormwater manual, there are mm. numerous engineering best practice guides that, that state that wet flood proofing should be secondary to good engineering design that keeps water away from building foundations. Um, they talk about hydrostatic pressure, um, et cetera. Um, then we go down to because we understood the peer review was closed, we have not reviewed the groundwater mounting, so they didn't review that. 
Um, and then the final bullet, we concur with the recommendations of the Conservation Commission that was expressed at the February 15th, 2024 meeting, which included the recommendations to collect additional groundwater levels at the site. We believe that the additional data collected would either help to validate or repudiate the established groundwater elevations and provide significantly more certainty. I think you have to scroll down to the next page. Thanks. Whoops, is that, was that it? I thought there was another sentence. Oh no, that was it. There was a period. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So I wanted to, to just make sure that that was in the record um, from our peer reviewer for the rest of the commissioners. Um, if, I have if some I additional questions, but I, I can I can yield the floor to, to um, I see Mike has his hand up. And then yeah, can you come I, back to if, me? If I may, can I? Um, sure, Mike, please. Well, those, Mr. Chair? Uh, oh, Dominic. I Yes, sorry. Uh, sorry, I didn't put my hand up. I was, I was just speaking. Um, yes, yeah, so on a, a couple of those. So one, the um, the item they had there about um, separation of to the foundations and infiltration into the foundation of the townhouses is is what I mentioned in my presentation, where we are willing, if if the commission wants it, sounds like you would, um, to reconfigure those systems such that we have that ten foot um, separation between the uh, the foundations and those infiltration systems. Um, one item um, on there that I I. I have to say one, so um, we, the applicant, um, had never, uh, were never provided with that email um, until we saw it on the agenda. Um, but having looked at it, I one thing I, I have noticed that, that I found very interesting in it in, um, and I don't know if you wanna bring it back up or not, but in the statement about, there is a statement there where they say that the applicants, uh, yeah, in the third, bullet point, they specifically say, well, the applicant's groundwater readings meet the mass stormwater manual, which is exactly what we've been saying. Um, and I find it interesting that subsequent to that, they then say, but go out and get more stormwater data. Um, I mentioned in my, in my presentation and I failed to get to it and I apologize. Um, we identified the location of uh, the very close location of a project that was recently um, that was recently approved by the commission at 51 Birch Street, where they performed test pits on site. Um, they did those test pits in November of 2023. They observed groundwater at an elevation of, I believe it was 0.46, um, and they designed their stormwater system with a bottom of elevation of 2.5. Um, so it is that, they have a groundwater system that is backed up to the same wetland system that they utilized a one-time observation of groundwater of 0.46. Um, we are using something that is three and a half feet higher than that for the bottom of our, for, for our estimated seasonal high ground. Um, and again, where I, I, I agree with Hatch's statement that our groundwater data meets the mass stormwater manual. Um, we have said that from the beginning and we stand by that. Um, and, and additional data is frankly, just dragging this out. Um, we, we did the test pits in accordance with this man manual. We use the most conservative data on the site. Um, and again, it is significantly more conservative than a project on the same wetland system that was approved, I believe two weeks ago. Um, so thank you dominic i i'd like chair if it's okay with you i'd like to hear what mike has to say and i have some more comments uh can you take down the take down the screen thank you sure um, mike please and thanks dominic uh i did want to bring into this discussion the latest uh, memo from scott horsley who as you know has been brought into this uh discussion and i uh think that the, the March 18th memo that he provided is uh, important for us to bring forward. And I see Scott's with us tonight. I don't know if you want him to comment at this point, but I would say that his points in that memo are important uh, in reviewing this project. 
So if there are no more comments from the commission. I, I have more comments from the commission. Mm. So I don't know what order you want to do this in, Chuck. It's up to I, you. I, would, I would echo to the, Mike's, Mike's request. Sure. Um, so I hear, does everyone agree that we should uh, bring Scott Horsley on right right now? To that's that's fine. Uh, and then Ryan, has, Ryan a, has something yeah, to say. This may be prepping for Scott. Um, the way I'm reading Hatch's uh, in, information is similar to what they said the other day in the meeting, which was, it seems like the numbers provided by the applicant pass the standards for the project, but that they are very close and give them concern and the margin of error is thin. And so I'd just like to have some consideration given is, is that actually true? And if so, is a pass a pass or do we need extra margin of error for a project like this? That's something that's not clear to me. I'd love to hear comments on that. Thank you. Yeah, respond to that, Mr. Chair? Sure, please, Dominic. Um, so the short answer is a pass is a pass. Um, DEP doesn't distinguish between if you have 2.00 feet of groundwater separation or two point something else. Um, a, a pass is a pass. Um, and as I as I just pointed out, um, you know, we have at at worst, we have, you know, a shade over two, um, which is exactly what a project adjacent to this site was just approved at. Um, so it is not, um, you don't, it, it, there's no other way to say this, you don't get bonus points. Um, what you get for having more groundwater separation is a lesser likelihood of having a groundwater mounding issue when you do your analysis, or if you can get up to that four feet, you don't have to do a analysis. So in an ideal world, we always shoot for the four feet. However, due to various, um, you know, to various grading issues at some point, sometimes you just can't get you can't build that system high enough uh, to get the four feet, and it's the and that was the situation here. But so they require a minimum of two, and they don't distinguish. I mean, they frankly they don't distinguish anything between two and four. You're either at the minimum of two, and you're doing X, Y, and Z, or you're at four, and you don't necessarily have to do those things. Okay. All right, so I'm going to um, allow Scott Horsley uh, to unmute and just introduce yourself and, and name and address for the for the record, please. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott Horsley, uh, 65 Little, Ro Little River Road, Catuit, Massachusetts. And I am uh, I've been retained by the Arlington Land Trust to uh, review this project. So thank you for the opportunity. I do not have a slideshow tonight. In fact, I would suggest that my slideshow I showed at the last hearing still stands because, in my opinion, nothing has changed. Uh, in fact, the only thing that I've seen the applicant do is have their attorney write a letter opposing my client putting in some wells to get some water levels. So that's the, I think that's the only new information, and I think that's worth considering. Why would they oppose additional water level data? Uh, that is what exactly what the commission decided at the last meeting. Uh, to collect additional information. And, and as several of your commission members pointed out tonight, um, the applicants saying, no, they don't want to do that. Now, I, I also, point number two is I disagree. I do not believe they are meeting the Mass DEP stormwater standards that is documented in my letters. Uh, if we had time tonight, I'd go through it again, but I don't think you want me to do that. It's already in the record, both, both in terms of testimony as well as written. And specifically, uh, Dominic mentioned, uh, he used the word exact location tonight, and that's in the record too. And I want to talk about what, in my opinion, what exact location means. The Mass DEP stormwater standards say that test pits and water levels must be established. Uh, and it, the, the actual word is at the location. Dominic's term is exact location. And I agree with Dominic. It should be the exact location. As I think the commission now knows, they are suggesting relying on a test pit that is not at the exact location, test pit five. It's not even within the footprint of the uh, stormwater infiltration system, the large one that we've been focusing on. Um, in fact, if you look at their most recent submittal, their measured water level at test pit seven, which is in within the large infiltration is minus 0.2 feet. 
That's what they use to do their Frimter calculations. By the way, Mike Frimter is a very close friend of mine and did a lot of work with him over the years. And I'd be happy to go into great detail about the Frimter method because I collaborated with him on it. But that's that's another story we can take up later. Very familiar with the Frimter analysis. Um, BSC has used a starting elevation of minus 0.2 feet as a as a measured water level at test feet seven. As I said in my most recent level, my, my, excuse me, my most recent letter, I have not seen a groundwater level below sea level. This is uh, something's going. Something is wrong here, which is what I my original testimony. Uh, these measurements don't make sense, uh, which is why we need more water level information. Uh, it would have cost less money for the applicant to put wells in and test it, less money than the attorney's efforts at putting a letter together opposing my client to produce water levels. Uh, so I just do not understand this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the commission, I think, uh, agreed, uh, based upon all the information submitted at the last meeting, that additional water levels should be developed. Uh, why would that not be a good idea? Why would the applicant not want to do that for good engineering practice? I cannot think of any reason why that wouldn't be, especially in light of the only test pit within the large infiltration that recorded a water level at minus 0.2 feet. I would love to hear an explanation of why they think the groundwater level might be at below sea level. Uh, I haven't seen it. Um, so I, I could go on in detail about that, but I won't. The other comment I would make is on the groundwater mounting analysis. They did provide a response to your question about why they use 1.2 hours as a duration for a 24-hour storm. Um, I frankly uh, don't understand it, and I, I disagree with it, and I would strongly suggest if this gets appealed to MassDEP that they would tell you they have never seen a groundwater mounting analysis for a stormwater system for a 24-hour storm at something like one hour. It just doesn't make sense. I think I understand the applicant's objective here to minimize the impacts by selecting a shorter period of duration because that would reduce the groundwater mounting, but it is a 24-hour storm. In fact, the, the applicant, the design of this site is to, in, to, to recharge and infiltrate a storm much larger than the, quote, required storm. And that's going to make it even larger. So the 1.2 hour duration, frankly, does not make sense, Mr. Chairman. The recent submittal by the BSC, in my opinion, doesn't make any sense. It does not comply with the storm order standards, and I don't think it'll stand up to the muster of a mass DEP review. And I would be more than happy to go into more detail or answer any questions. But I think uh, since our last hearing, again, the only new data I see is the letter from the attorney opposing additional water level data. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, Chair, can I just to... make uh, one clarification to something there uh, that Mr. Horsley said that was blatantly wrong? Um, the only test, there are two test pits in that we observe groundwater at in, in the large system. The other one at a test pit eight, a groundwater elevation of two and a half that we observed. Also, again, the groundwater elevation that we observed was also observed by the town selected and chosen peer reviewer, Whitestone Engineering. They concurred with what we observed for groundwater uh, on that site. And again, those aren't the numbers we're using. Per, per an approved project by this commission a few weeks ago, we could have been justified using what we actually observed on the site, but we didn't. We used something significantly higher um, because we felt that was significantly more conservative and appropriate for this matter. Um, and when you add that to, again, there was a test bit done in 2020 as part of the comprehensive permit that is just outside the limits of the large system when the design was a little different, which also had groundwater well below anything that we observed at this point. Mr. Chairman, if I may, through you, could we ask Dominic, why not collect some water level data now during the high spring data? Why stop debating this? Why don't we just collect the real data through you, sir? Dominic, do you uh, do you have an answer to that question? Chair, I'll say we stand by we we did the groundwater did we got the data during the spring when it was required in the high groundwater season in May when it was twenty twenty three with the peer reviewer. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I was going to note that the answer was in the response. Uh, back to the commission. Uh, any commission members would have a question or a comment about what we just heard um, or anything else that they reviewed in between these two meetings. Uh, so, uh, Susan, I'm going to go with David Kaplan because um, he hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Uh, thank you. Um, um, Mr. Rinaldi, could you um, please speak to, I guess, the the claim about you know, the the duration of the mounding analysis? And can you just, I guess, paraphrase or explain your explanation that you put together in the letter that's on the record? Or yeah, so in, in its simplest terms, um, the groundwater mounting analysis is done for the required recharge, right? The purpose of it is to prove that that when you when you build out a site, you're putting pavement buildings, things like that down that will reduce what otherwise naturally would would recharge to the groundwater. So Mass DEP has this standard where depending on your soil types, you calculate out a required recharge volume, which we did. And you do the ground and what they require is that the ground the required recharge volume doesn't create a groundwater mound that breaks out over the surface of a wetland or a water body. So what we did was we analyzed, we took that required recharge volume, ran it through the model and determined the start time when it starts infiltrating and the end time when it stops infiltrating. So there's no more water going into the system. The way the mounting analysis works, if you, you put in a rate, an infiltration rate, and whatever that duration that you run is, it just keeps putting that water in and building that mound. So if you ran it for 24 hours, but it doesn't actually, it isn't actually infiltrating for 24 hours, you're representing something that isn't happening. So what we did is we determined when the infiltration starts, when it finishes, and that was the duration that we ran. And again, this was exactly the way we did it in the comp permit which was peer reviewed by the town's peer reviewer beta group and, and confirmed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, uh, David? I, I'm gonna, if not, I'm gonna turn to Susan. Uh, not, not at the moment. Okay, Susan. So, um... I am concerned that the groundwater elevations on this site are not obviously not uniform. Um, the range of elevations from below sea level to four is concerning to me. Um, if there is such a range, then how do we know that the elevations over the main stormwater unit aren't even higher than four. I mean, if you're looking, you know, at a, you know, what's your standard deviation there? There's a very wide range on the site. I don't know if that's due to soil type. I don't know if that's due to the wetland. I don't know what it's due to, or maybe there was a well, you know, a test pit that was put in incorrectly. I don't know, but I am concerned that I don't really understand, putting aside that things might have been done to the letter of the comprehensive permit, we're here reviewing this again. And I am concerned with the level of uncertainty. That is one of the reasons why I voted with the rest of the commission to ask for real data. I'm a scientist, I'm sure you're a scientist. You know, real data is something that we can grab hold of and say, okay, this supports this or it doesn't, it repudiates it. So I, I, I guess I'm still back there wishing I had real data, real groundwater data to either support or not support the estimated um, high groundwater, seasonal high groundwater level. That's where I am. I mean, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, to clarify, and this is real data. Okay, it's called the estimated seasonal high groundwater because that's the terminology. But 
where we, um, in that table we showed and we provided again uh, last week, I believe, week before, um, we observed groundwater at certain elevations and it did vary. And honestly, I've seen weirder. Sometimes things just just do that. It's it's strange. It, it you know how what it has to do with paths through water. I, I honestly don't know. But um, sometimes you you observe groundwater and it varies pretty wildly over a site. Um, the the we didn't observe any groundwater at elevation four. We observed redox features at elevation four, and redox features again are representative of a groundwater level that comes up to that point regularly enough to basically leave that, lack of a better term, staining in the in the soil. Um, that was the highest thing. The water at that at that uh, at test pit five was a good foot below what we observed uh, where we observed redox. The actual water that we observed was down uh, 60 inches when we observed the redox 48 inches deep. So we're again we're using uh, we're using something that's higher than anything we actually observed on the site. So and that is real data and that is the standards as as to how it's set and it's you know it is how commissions all over including this one have approved any number of projects under the lens protection. So thank you for that answer. I think my use of the term real was a misnomer. I didn't mean real data. I meant supportive data. So, you know, when we're looking at these kinds of things, um, a redox or a point in time, test pit or whatever, if there are inconsistencies, then getting additional information for weight of evidence to tell us this is correct or this is not correct for such a large project that could have such an impact in an area we know floods all the time. That's what I'm asking for. And if you ask me right now, right now, if I had enough information to, to vote on this project as a commissioner, I would say no. That's where I am. Okay. Um, any other comments from the commission? Dominic, I had a, I had a question. Um, Brian raised his hand too, Chuck. You may not have seen. Oh, Brian, you certainly can step in front of me. Uh, you're muted though to fix that. Yeah, sorry. I'm asking some naive questions because I'm new. I guess, um, Dominic, you, you said two things in that they uh, built a cushion into your calculation. One was that you used storm water, uh, stor storm levels that were higher than necessary, the, the plus plus number. And I think the second one was you used worst case levels for the, the estimated seasonal high groundwater. If you didn't do those things, what kind of cushions would we have? Is that a calculation that would be valuable in this discussion or is that not relevant? Um, well, I mean, if we didn't use the the highest data across the site, we, you know, these, these systems, the bottoms of those systems could vary um, for depending on what we found in, in a given area, but mm. uh, instead they're, they're consistent. The bottom of every system is, is set at elevation six. Um, the, if we didn't use the NOAA plus plus data, um, all these infiltration systems would be small um, because we wouldn't have had to attenuate uh, these, these much larger storms. Uh, so the systems would just, you know, instead the, I, I, off the cuff, I couldn't tell you precisely how much smaller, uh, you know, but they would be small. Okay. I guess I'm just trying to maybe. Oh, and if I may, sorry. Um, the third item was the infiltration rate. I'm using a conservative infiltration, which is the same thing. If we use the more, if we use the higher infiltration rate, the systems would be smaller because that water would disappear out of them quicker and we wouldn't have to hold it as long. So th those are sort of, I mean, Susan's concern and many of our concern is this is so darn close to the margin of error. So then are those factors that you just mentioned, should they give us some comfort that the margin may not be as tight as feared? I mean, that was, that was the intent of doing that is to make it a conservative system that again, uh, doesn't just meet 
you know, rainfall today, but meets the long term. I mean, climate change is real. It's happening, um, which is why, um, you know, I, 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 I would, uh, I would ask, I would ask the chair or some other member to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that that is why at some point the commission used that NOAA plus plus mm -hmm. requirement in the bylaw um, is to is to it is a, a higher number. It's it's actually a, a higher number. You may be aware the DP is in the process of of revising um, the the Wilderness Protection Act specifically with regard to stormwater, um, and they are going to use what um, they're calling NOAA Plus, which is um, somewhere in between, but is actually again less than what the town requires and less than what we used here. So even what we use here uh, for stormwater for for rainfall would actually exceed what the DEP's new requirements will be whenever they come into play, and they are specifically doing that to account for future rainfall and climate change. Chuck, can I just respond to that specific? Sure, thanks, Susan. Issue? Um, I I actually applaud using the NOAA plus plus. I I advocated for that during the comprehensive permit process. But my understanding is that the NOAA plus plus allows you to design a stormwater system that can hold more water because the NOAA plus plus talks about more rainfall. It doesn't tell you where that system should be placed on the right. These are these are two different which things. has to do with the estimated high groundwater and and soil permeability, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is that not true? Yes, that's that's okay. correct. These Thank are, you. Two I just want to clarify that for Brian because um just just so that he understands. Thank you. Okay. Um I had a question about the USGS uh monitoring wells. So were, was any data collected from those wells and compared to this site, or was that something that was wasn't done? I am I was kind of lost. I'm I'm actually asking you to help me with my next question. Yeah, no, that's okay. So that's the Frinter analysis. So okay. The Frinter analysis we utilized, um, and I, I apologize, I don't need to front me, but um, it's uh, the nearest well, I believe is in Lexington. Um, and I mm -hmm. publish certain data that you use in, in that comparison. And so how, how does it help you? So we have point of time, um, you know, groundwater levels here. And in Lexington, we... We have, uh, you know, we know what the fluctuation rate is over there. So what would you, I mean, I'm assuming the groundwater is not at the same level. So we're really, we would only be comparing the fluctuation between high and low levels. What, what are you, what would you compare if we had uh, more monitoring data, I guess is, is where I'm at. In terms of compared to the the USGS well, so if you had if so the commission asked to um, do some more monitoring, what would have been gained to compare that monitoring to the USGS wells? Um, would it only be the rate at which the groundwater fluctuates, or would no, there be more? It, it's it's basically a, a point in time measurement so what you're doing is you're taking what you measure on your site and then you're using um as mr horsley wrote it's the frontier analysis it's a it's a calculation um and you're using data from that well so you're looking for a well that's in the same material and it's as close as can be um and ideally in the same watershed and you're saying and they publish certain data with regards to um the, you know, it's the maximum, you know, the maximum level they've ever observed, as well as you go deeper in and get um, data for the time that from that well for when you actually got your data and you, we put it into a spreadsheet rather than doing that by hand. And it gives you, it gives you uh, basically, it doesn't give you an elevation. It gives you, a, I believe, a depth and then using our elevation, we back out that number to get what they uh, uh, refer to as, as they don't refer to as an estimated sea level, but I believe they refer to as an approximate um, or a, an expected 
groundwater elevation. So it's sort of a way to back check what you're finding and seeing, you know, based on data that's publicly available that includes, you know, the highest elevation ever measured in that well, you know, what, what would you expect under these circumstances? Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming that we still have permission to, uh, from the commission to bring Scott Horsley on when he raises his hand. So I'm just going to go to Scott and ask him to, uh, to unmute and, and uh, start, start uh, ask your question. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Briefly, I just want to respond or add to Dominic's comment, which I agree with him on. He mentioned point in time, and I totally agree with that. Point in time means you measure it once at a specific moment and try to figure out what's going on. What I recommended, and this is current standard technology, is a device called the pressure transducer, which um, Dominic may or may not be aware of. I'm not sure, but it's commonly used in the groundwater hydrology business now to monitor water levels. It takes a measurement every 15 minutes. And it's uh, very inexpensive, uh, again, less expensive than the attorney's memo on opposing this data, um, where we could get a measurement through the high water table time, which is currently March, April, and May. And this would be the data that the commission already decided that they wanted. This is, uh, in fact, uh, there are wells in place. I understand this could be installed tomorrow. The, inf the equipment, uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I'm, BSC may own this equipment. I'm not sure. If not, it's easily rentable. It could be installed tomorrow. And we get a measurement every 15 minutes through the next uh, few months. Um, it strikes me that would be really valuable data unless somebody was concerned about it being problematic to the design. If the applicant feels confident that their, their uh, high water table uh, determinations are correct, then this would be a great way for them to justify it, Mr. Chairman. Very easy to do. We can start tomorrow. Pressure transducer, yeah, easily, easy to install. Uh, this is the data that the commission already decided they wanted. And I, I think it's uh, given, again, the size of this project, the complexity of the site. Uh, I can't imagine why we collectively, including the applicant and their attorney, might not want this. Why not? So I'm going to go right to Stephanie. I see her hands up. Yeah. Um, so, sure. Stephanie Chairman, Kiefer, thank you. yeah. Thank you, Stephanie Kiefer, Smolak, and Vaughn. Um, just um, there's been some, um, I think, misstatement that I, I, first I'd like to clarify. The um, the applicant um, submitted a letter. To, I submitted on behalf of the applicant a letter to the select board um, objecting to the proposal to install wells. And the reason for that is the wells were, the, the application that was submitted never had surveyed information and it is so close to being a trespass on our property. Never sought our permission. And it's obviously anybody here would preserve their property rights. Um, similarly, Mr. Horsley has repeatedly said that you need to have wells that are within the infiltration system. Um, those proposed wells were outside of the infiltration system and actually close to a public sewer line. So we raised those concerns to the select board. The select board did what it did, but um, I, I think that there's no, there's absolutely no misdeed by protecting one's property rights and then noting the inconsistency with proposed locations of wells that are completely not in the location that they should have been. Um, and I would say that, um, and I think that Dom did this in his presentation, so I don't need to reiterate, but when we're talking about a point in time and, and talking about wells, um, we have had multiple readings. Um, we did the reading in November of 2020, again, peer reviewed within the conservation or within the um, comprehensive permit process. We did, um, again, in accordance with the um, with the town's review and oversight, the wells in May of 2023. Dom presented updated from February of 24. And um, likewise, during the course of the proceedings for this matter, the commission has reviewed and approved 51 Burke Street 
we are direct butters that did one single well in November, um, I believe of 23. Um, now, if I understand that there are concerns in this neighborhood, um, but the concerns in this neighborhood are, are somewhat death by a thousand cuts. And I think that if we are going to look at applying the Wetlands Protection Act, we should look at applying it fairly as to all applicants and not create new requirements. And just because somebody stands their ground and does not agree to requirements that are outside of the scope of the Wetlands Protection Act, it is not correct and it's not proper to assign motives to that. Thank you. Okay, um, David Kaplan, I know that I cut you off a little bit. Do you still uh, want to respond with a question or comment? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm still trying to understand what, um, you know, additional information we could get, you know, through the groundwater monitoring. Um, so, you know, ostensibly the seasonal high groundwater table is creates the modeling that was observed. So, I mean, it is, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how does groundwater monitoring estimate the water table better than uh, a method that's approved by the DEP? Because, I mean, it may, it may get different numbers, but then at that point, how do we know if that's a better number than what was identified on site through an approved method. Okay, so. Chuck, can I, I are sure. you gonna answer that or can I, and maybe we can. If you wanna to add to it, I. I, I just wanted to add to it just a little bit. I, I think that that we'd all agree that redox is a, is a good method. The problem is it wasn't, we don't have redox measurements over the main stormwater unit. We don't have reliable redox measurement. Now they say they're gonna use the highest one. I on thought the they study. had a, I, I, I thought they had one a test bit. I mean, one of the test bits was low, but they had redox features that what was a test bit seven, but there's seven and eight, eight in that, in that one, wonky. so it would be seven. And it was inconsistent, yeah. I think that's what I would feel comfortable with is getting the data over because of the inconsistency of this site, that that's, I keep coming back to that. I would like the, the data over that stormwater system. And, and I agree, right. it may not be better than redox data, but it's giving me another piece of information to give me certainty that if, if I'm gonna approve this project, I'm not approving a project that's gonna flood in an area that floods right. all the time because I don't feel I have enough certainty given the, the variability at the site. I do agree that redox is, is the, maybe the gold standard. You know, I don't know. And, and, and Dominic, can you remind me what the current separation from groundwater is under that big infold, in, you know, under the infiltration system proposed at test pit seven and eight? Well, utilizing the elevation of four, which is higher than what we saw on there, it's it's a shade over two. It's, uh, you yeah, know, well, it's two. We, we had, Technically, we used a groundwater elevation of three point nine eight, but I like round numbers. Um, three point so, nine in the in the redox in the redox characteristics gave you an elevation of two point five. So what yeah. we saw in what we observed for groundwater, actual observed groundwater that may the highest was in that particular system was two point five. And that and was from we, the water level, or was that from that was the, from the water level? That was observed groundwater in test bit eight. Okay. And remind me what the redox uh, elevations were. In, I, I know. I'm sorry. In test bit uh, seven, I think it is. Well, so again, the test pit seven redox are not indicative of a groundwater. They're indicative of a moment in time where groundwater perched there left some staining, but doesn't continue through the test pits. I, I, understand, I, I understand that's your position, but can you just tell me what the elevation uh, is? For the record, it's not my position. That is the standard per DEP under okay. both the stormwater requirements and the septic system requirements. Um, if you do the septic system and you do this, you would still, it, it, the same reason that Whitestone did not set the groundwater at that elevation, they set it at where we observed groundwater. 
Um, and and what you, is that elevation, have, please? Sorry, what was that? What is, what is the elevation number, please? Uh, that was the one that was below sea level. Well, he's asking. No, I, I'm asking what the redox feature. Oh, the is. redox was. What's the elevation number? I I just heard it in terms of. Uh, I think you expressed it earlier uh, this evening in terms of uh, out, you know de depth below the, depth. the elevation. Yeah. So which doesn't so help just me. To, just yeah. yeah. So sorry. Just to clarify, when you do the test pits, you're digging down and you measure down from the top of the test pits to indicate all of these things. So you right. mark them up in depth. And then you go get the ground elevation at the point of the test pit and you back out the actual right. elevation. Um, yeah, so that's what I was trying to get it convert, converted to, because you're, you're saying you're using an elevation of uh, uh, 3.98 for your design. So I'm just curious as to what that redox feature was. What's that elevation expressed in the same unit, the <laughs> same measurement? I just don't remember what that was. Okay. Uh, I know he's working on it. I six. think Scott Horsley was. No, no, no. Uh, Dominic's working on oh, okay. an answer. Yeah, it'd be uh, six, it's 34 inches, I believe, down from the from the ground elevation, which is 8.92. So be, okay. So it'd be at six. Okay. All right. Six nice. point. If you want to. But I, yeah, I understand. I, I understand the reasons why you're. Um, Disc di discounting it or dismissing it or not using it, I guess, is the right word. Um, I guess just a comment to David Kaplan that actually the DEP uh, handbook does say that, uh, where is it, when redox, when redox features are not available, installation of temporary push point wells or piezometers should be considered. Ideally, such wells should be monitored in the spring when groundwater is highest. And results compared to nearby groundwater to nearby groundwater wells monitored by the USGS to estimate whether the regional groundwater is below normal normal or above normal. So it's mm. just just comment to David Kaplan. So it's not. I don't think we're going out too. We're not going off the reservation by asking making that request. But I, I, you know, and it, said, it does say should consider. They're not um, there. So. That's all I have at this point. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see that Scott Hosley has his hand up again. Scott. I just wanted to try to provide a direct answer to Nathaniel Stevens' question. I believe the answer is 5.8 feet, but you can look at the data. It was in my original letter. It comes from the data presented by BSC. I think that was the question asked, and that should be the answer provided. That question, in my opinion. Um, and as Nathaniel suggested, the mass DEP standards do say exactly what he said. When redox features are not reliable, which is what BSC is suggesting, monitoring wells should be installed, measured through the season, and compared to USGS wells. That's exactly what we proposed, and that is exactly what the commission asked for. Scott, can I follow up? And those wells, uh, when they talk about that in the stormwater standards, is those the wells that they're talking about? Are they talking about installing those within the infiltration chamber? Exactly. To use Dominic's wording, the exact location, not test pit five. That's not the exact location. The actual wording in the stormwater standards is at the location, which I would agree with Dominic. It should be at the exact location, not test pit five. That's not the exact location. The, the correct location is at test pit seven. That's where the well should be installed. The well that's there clearly is not working. It's minus 0.2 feet. There's something wrong with it. It's clogged, wasn't installed properly. I don't know, but it's not 0.2 feet, not minus 0.2 feet. We need a, a properly installed well there in compliance with the stormwater standards. It's not a big deal. It's inexpensive. We can get it done tomorrow. Okay. Any other comments uh, from the commission? Okay. So I'm going to turn this uh, and ask for some comments. Uh, maybe there are some comments from, I know Scott Horsley was able to speak. 
with the commission, with the applicant as part of this, but there might be some comments out there, but I just want to let you know that um, the Conservation Commission through our office received 29, uh, as, at my count, between the last two meetings, emails regarding Thorndike Place by the, the abutters and by concerned parties. Um, and the majority of those uh, had to do with flooding and the applicant's denial of the Conservation Commission's request to perform more monitoring. Uh, so if you want a full list and to read each one of those comments, uh, you can go to the Thorndike page, which is part of the conservation page um, on our website. But I also asked it to be available for uh, Ryan to put that in our, in our chat. Um, So not only can the Conservation Commission see this correspondence, but the applicant and anyone else who is interested. So I thought it was um, I thought it was important to mention that because it seems like I hadn't remembered that much comments coming in on any other projects since I've been on the commission, and I can't remember if that's seventeen or more years, but somewhere around that time. And so I, I just wanted to lead with that and to say that we have a lot of concerned people here, um, you know, about their about their uh, their house and their flooding. And the flooding has happened consistently. And I think we're talking about the large infiltration system. And I understand that, but we're not talking about all the other infiltration systems. So I guess those are okay. And so this one infiltration system that has some wells in it that seem to put out some data that's inconsistent has been most of the conversation and even beyond habitat, even beyond, um, you know, other comments that have been made, traffic, uh, which is not part of our purview, but, you know, let's say erosion and all that kind of stuff that we are interested in. And I, I guess I wonder this one, this one infiltration chamber uh, with its capacity based on 14 plus plus uh, is, you know, I guess at some point you expect it to fill up. And when it fills up, where does it overflow? And is there any freeboard? Um, is there any freeboard in that design to allow for fluctuation? I assume that question. No, no, sorry, Dominic, if you had an answer but, before you, I go. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it overflows around the back of the large building. Uh, there is an outlet to the south of the large building that in larger storms, it uh, overflows into. And I will dig up uh, how much free board there is in the uh, 100 year storm event, which again is the largest storm event analyzed and again is 11 inches for what we did uh, let's pull that up right now and bear with me for a sec let's go to scroll through Wow, that's uh, this is the big point. There's uh, in the hundred year storm event, it comes with to about a two inches below the top of the inside top of that system. Can you say that again? In the 100 year storm event, which is uh, actually 11 and a half inches, sorry, um, it, it comes to uh, about two inches below the top of that system. Okay. Okay. And again, it's outletting around that, overflowing. And I want to get to these other comments, but I'm just from my own curiosity, I'm, I would be 
it would be interesting to know the elevations out there and which way it would head. But uh, that being said, I do want to right, turn which, to which way, which way. So once it, so you said it overflows around the back of the building. Is there an outlet or is that, and then which? There's a piped outlet. There's a piped outlet. With and then outlet. the elevation of the undisturbed ground, in which direction does it head? Towards? It would, it would flow south. It would go south. And south is towards? South is towards the wetland is route two, wherever you Route know. two. So From, it's going to discharge and naturally head towards route two. Yes. As per the existing contours that are out there now. Yep. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, if anyone has attended uh, attending tonight's hearing who wants to have a comment, please raise your hand using the uh, reactions button. Uh, it is 10 o'clock. I'm going to do as many uh, comments as I can possibly do in a few, in 15 minutes, and we we'll let you have at least two minutes to make a comment. Uh, first one I saw was Matthew, uh, and I don't see the last name. Oh, McKinnon. Sure, Matt, un unmute, please, and uh, state your name and address for the record. My name is Matthew McKinnon. I live at 9 Little John Street in Arlington. Um, I heard mentioned by the applicant uh, a house being built at 51 Birch Street. Um, I was at the uh, February 21st uh, Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals phone call regarding 51 Birch Street. And I'd just like to note for the record that this house is being built on stilts. It will not have a basement nor a slab foundation of any sort. Um, it's also interesting that another house literally right around the corner uh, on Edith Street, I believe the numbers for that duplex is 14 and 16, uh, was also built up on stilts. Uh, again, no basement, no foundation whatsoever. I believe it sits about eight to 10 feet above uh, the street level or at least the, the parking level. Um, I just wanted to make that noted. Uh, I find it very interesting that these new uh, structures are being built on stilts rather than uh, being built at the foundation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. That was a good comment. Uh, Carol, please state your name for the record. Carol Kowalski, 182 Situate Street, Arlington. I don't live anywhere near this neighborhood. I am a former planning director for the town of Arlington mm. and approached in 2009 by Oak Tree Development seeking to develop the site. And I said, we've got a lot of great sites where you could do some fantastic multifamily. But they insisted on pursuing this site. And I explained why I did not think that was a good idea. And here we are today. And I'm urging the commission to please heed the letter that Scott Horsley has submitted on behalf of the Arlington Land Trust, which I want to say is also on behalf of the town. The select board and town meeting have voted repeatedly for 30 years to try to do everything to protect this land because it floods and the consequences of this development we will be living with for, for 50 years if this proceeds without adequate data so any any additional information we can get now is a worthwhile investment because we will be living with the consequences for decades to come so i urge the commission to please request and require that the applicant perform the additional data gathering that scott has scott horsley has requested in his letter thank you Hey, Kathy. Uh, Carol, thank you very much for those. Um, Derek Straub, uh, please unmute and uh, state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Derek Straub, 57 Dorothy Road. Um, so I'm asking the uh, applicant here, I guess, to see if any of their calculations have taken into the into account the storms that are actually uh, flooding Dorothy Road on a consistent basis. Um, our, our street floods consistently, and I'd say it majorly floods about five times a year. Um, so do any of their calculations take into account, you know, inches to potentially feet of water flowing into their property and into our properties during these storm events? And also, is it can they attest that they will not have any water 
leaving their property and adding to the flooding on Dorothy Road. Thank you. Yeah, so I can I can let you know that in the uh, decision of the comprehension permit, it does state that the applicant says that no water will leave the, leave the property. As far as the first question, I do not know the answer to that, but uh, it was a good comment. Uh, Robert DiBiase. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Robert DiBiase, 29 Little John Street. I am a direct abutter to the property, um, whereas my basement slab sits at about four feet below um, the street level. And I can see water on an average basis of a good rainstorm about six inches down below slab where my sump pumps were. So as a direct abutter, I'm within 50 feet of the property line. I can tell you that the water heights in my basement are of that level. And on a second note, I'm curious of when the applicant actually showed up on the 15th to do the um, testing or to do the reading of their wells, what time it was so we could um, check our records as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Uh, any other comments from, oh, uh, I see Rob's still hand up. So Sarah, oh. all good? If you want to mute and uh, state your name and address for the record. Yes, Sarah Allgood, uh, Dorothy Road. I have two questions and one comment, if I may. My first question is, and I apologize for, for not being a hydrologist here, but my first question is the water monitoring data analysis that's been um, provided, is this based on the type of soil sample analysis that the applicant carried out? Um, is, is Dominic, is that a question that you could answer? I guess I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, Sarah, could you restate your question? Yes, so, um, so the water monitoring data analysis that is carried out does this vary based on the type of soil that is present? So um, I remember in the applicant's presentation, they showed various different soil samples and they said, um, I can't remember exactly what the it's sandy loom or something that was, was analyzed. So I was just wondering if you had a different soil sample, would that impact the, the data analysis for the hydrology studies? It wouldn't impact the groundwater levels. It would impact the end calculations for the for the round. Right. Okay. So my second question then is, I'm just curious, how many soil samples were actually analyzed, given the fluctuations and diversity in terrain that that we've we've heard about quite a lot tonight. Um, Mr. Chair, through the chair, if you'd like. Yeah, um, do you so have eight, please. eight test pits were done in 2023 and three were previously done in 2020. So how many soil samples were analyzed? Well, so you, you, you look at the soils in each of those test pits. So 11. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and the reason I ask that is because, again, Dorothy Road resident, I can absolutely state with great confidence that I do not have um, loomy sand type soil. My soil in, in, in my garden is clay like soil. And I think many other residents of Dorothy Ro Road and the neighborhood would attest to that. So I found that comment, um, that analysis um, surprising. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any other comments from uh, uh, any abutters or people attending tonight's meeting about the stormwater? Chuck, I think Mr. de Blasi had just a simple question that maybe Dominic could answer. He was just simply asking. Sure. Could you restate you know, what, it? What time of day, if Dominic remembers, what time of day were they on the site for the soil, uh, for the, when you collected those additional samples? I'll give you an exact time, sometime during the work day. 
Are you talking about the February, the, the February? Yeah, the recent one, the recent data that uh, Dominic mentioned in his presentation. Okay. Morning or afternoon? Sorry, I didn't to just ask that question. I, I'm just trying to clarify that the question. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I, honestly, I honestly don't know offhand about I me. Mean, it was it was sometime during the work day. I don't recall. Okay, okay. Right. sorry. So I that, thought we could. I just thought that'd be a simple, simple question to answer, but understand. Thanks. Yeah, I, I well, didn't realize you. Uh, uh, that was the uh, answer. So okay. we do a lot during the work day, so I don't always. Okay. Okay, so uh, Derek, Robert, and Sarah, you've all had uh, an opportunity. So I'm going to ask you to be very quick. We'll start with Derek Straub. Derek Straub, 57 Dorothy Road. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to uh, ask you a question. You stated that in their uh, their application that they will not have any water leave their property and enter Dorothy Road. Um, what are the repercussions if it does happen in the future? You know, I, I to be honest with you, I uh, would turn to the uh, someone else on the commission to answer. Yeah. So I, I, I just think it's not it. it so this, I can talk about my town, but it's, it's just simply not allowed where I work. I don't believe it's it's allowed here. But maybe Dominic could uh, help me out here with with where this is going. I mean, it's not you've designed the water to stay on the property. I, I appreciate that they designed that, but what are the repercussions if it doesn't is the, is really the question. From the Conservation Commission, uh, there, as far as uh, it, so we look for a uh, measurable uh, impact. And so one event wouldn't do that. And, but if it, if it continued and there was some sort of erosion or some sort of problem uh, that the commission could link to the Wetlands Protection Act, our own uh, wetlands protection regulations here in, in Arlington, we would certainly have an issue. Outside of that, you, were, you would direct your comments about water coming off the property to the town DPW. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, Sarah, uh, all good. Hi, yes, Sarah over Dorothy Road. So my last question is, uh, I understand that the uh, original test case sampling was done in May. Uh, do we have a date in May? Are we talking the beginning of the month or the end of the month? It was May 18th and 19th, 2023. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and the last question uh, I'm going to entertain here would be uh, Mr. Robert uh, DiBiase. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I guess my question is directed towards Dominic. Um, this is scientific data that we're gathering here on that test, you know, coming out to take a measurement on the 15th in February. We should have a log of who showed up and who witnessed it. Um, what time of day it was. I, I don't think that's too much to ask. I know that a lot of the fields out there would require logs on who shows up, what time, and we just were looking for that information just to back it yeah. up. So that's my last question, but thank you very much. Yeah, I'm also surprised that it wouldn't be on the test bit data log, but may, that may be the case. And I know those uh, that information has been, uh, it's probably part of the comprehensive permit, but Maybe we can find that and put it on the, the website. Susan, no, do you have any February, comments on that? The <laughs> February data, Dominic, didn't you just? It's 2024. 2024. This is new data. We don't have it. I I didn't even know about it till Dominic just talked about it, unless I missed it somewhere. It was in one of it was in his one of his letters. Oh, it was in a letter. Okay. But but it's just it was just presented in table form. Yeah. There were no data. And it's, no and it's, it's measurements, it's not the test pits. The right. Mr. Chair, you're probably right. I don't think the test pits probably have times written on them, but those were the test pits. I'm sorry, I was referring to wells, the wells that you claim that you had, had measured. I'm looking to find out the date and time that somebody came out to the field and measured the well depth, whether they did it with a stick or however they chose to do it, who came out, when, who witnessed it, and that's what we're looking for. Thank you. We have we have the date. We don't have the time. Is it, yeah, so Dominic, is there any additional uh, information? It, not verbal. Is it really I mean, that, when you measure a one time measurement of a round well, mm -hmm. that 
you're particularly concerned with, it's the date. It's the date and the time. Somebody drove out to Little John Street and Dorothy Road, parked a car. Got All right, uh, Mr. DiBiase, I think we, we understand your point. I don't want to get into the, kind of like a back and forth. Uh, but so the commission has asked if there's additional data concerning those test pits, if you could provide it to us uh, in between the meetings, and then we would we would post that information uh, on our website. So that or even if would... they were in test pits, if it was just groundwater well data. Yeah. 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 Then, then we would like to see it. Yeah. The, OK. Yeah. OK. OK. So public comment is uh, is ended and uh, back to the commission for any further comments or or motions. And I think a number of commission members have said that they uh, well, a number. I don't know if it was a number. I know Susan said it. Maybe others did. But I want to. I want to say for myself uh, that hearing tonight's comments and knowing how I felt, I, I I do feel uneasy. I don't feel like I have enough uh, certainty to ensure that there's a minimum of two feet of separation between the bottom of the infiltration chamber and the seasonal high groundwater, where the infiltration chamber is located between Trespits between test pit seven and test pit eight. And I would ask again that you honor the Conservation Commission's request to do additional monitoring in that area. And if you find that you need to install a few new wells to get accurate information for this site, I would ask you to also do that. And with that, I'll turn to the commission for any further comments or motions. Oh. And if, if we're going to get a motion to continue, I want to ask the applicant if they would grant that. So Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks. I think we need to continue, if not for stormwater, definitely for uh, the invasive species thing. I, so, um, that's absolutely true. And I did ask for uh, continuation on habitat and, and the invasive species at the kind of at the lead into this uh, right. this application. Sure. And I, I just want to make one comment more, I think more for the public, and especially some people who sent us comments, which are all appreciate, uh, very much appreciated, uh, that we, the commission doesn't have the authority to demand or require the applicant to install these wells that we are requesting. Chuck's using the right word. We're requesting it. We're requesting for that that information. So at the best we can do, you know, try to tr convince them, try to plead with them to provide that information so we make a decision, so we can uh, make our decision. We do have the power, however, to deny a permit application for lack of information. And I think that's what uh, Susan is sort of hinting at. Um, just, I just want to make it, and I'm sure the applicant picks up on this, but I think yeah. members of the audience might not, people attending might not understand that we don't have the authority to order or direct mm -hmm. them to do something, require them to do something. We can just urgently uh, you know, re request it and strong, strongly suggest that it might be in their best interest to do so. That's as best as we can do. So I just want to explain that to, to folks in sure. the audience. Sure. Uh, any other comments from the commission? So I have two requests from, for uh, BSC. Dave, Dave Kaplan. Dave has oh, sorry, comment. Dave. I Go for it. Yeah. I, go ahead, I Dave. Just had a, maybe, maybe we can sort of close the door. I think there was another comment that was floating around um, a potential condition for like a 10 foot separation from foundations. And I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm not comfortable you know, making a request that's sort of outside our purview. I'm hoping other permitting agencies and building codes will, will take that and, um, and, and consider that and make that decision. That's, wanted to make that comment. All right. Thank you. Um, so with, with that, I'm going to... Sorry. <laughs> sure, sir. I'm going to close this out. I have uh, three requests. Okay. First, I would like to ask Dominic and Matt if they would submit those slides to the commission so we could review them between this meeting and the next meeting, both the invasive slides that we saw at our last meeting and the slides that Dominic presented tonight. That was a, so a lot of good information in there, and I, I want to make sure that we're, we're on top of that. And I also want to ask um, the applicant if they will continue until April 4th. 
and we will pick up on habitat and stormwater. Uh, sorry, did I get off mute? I think Stephanie was trying to say something and they... I, I was just going to quickly respond. Um, yes, we can continue until April 4th. Thank you. And Dominic, is the slides available for us? Uh, I, I know it's Dominic and Matt, but I don't see Matt. Oh, there's Matt, right? Oh, no. Actually, Stu, there you go. Sorry, Thank you, Matt. my camera turned off. Yeah. But, Are those slides yeah. available for us to review between between these two meetings? Is that... Is that yeah, uh, we, can, we can get those to you. Those are just, you know, Tom's kind of introduction to mm -hmm. his, his strategy for dealing with invasives. So I'm sure we can share that. And I'd like at the next meeting for you to go over those slides, uh, you know, again, and then at the end, we will have some questions. So that would be the first thing that we're going to, we would do. And uh, great. all right, Matt, thank you. And Dominic, those slides, you're going to get those to us also. Is there, is there oh, okay? Yeah, I, I, basically his answer was. Provoked. Appreciate it. Okay. And with that, uh, can I get a motion from the commission to continue this hearing of Thorndike Place to April 4th? So moved. moved. Uh, okay, and I have a second. I'm going to say uh, Mike Gill's game got that. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to, I had no idea, but I know that Nathaniel said second. So it's Nathaniel got a second. So there you go. All right. So let's close this out. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Chuck Taroni says yes. All right. April 4th. Uh, we'll, we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone, for uh, attending Thank tonight's you. meeting. Thank you. If there's nothing else, Chuck, I'll make a motion to adjourn, or did you have anything else? I don't have anything else. And for this one, we can, I think it's appropriate that we just, everyone just says waves and we're done. Okay. So uh, Thanks, make a motion. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Bye now. Bye everyone. Bye. Yeah. Right. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.